Welcome Dark Warriors, this is Rumin. Consider this a sorta sequel to my Silent Hill games ranking. I thought it would be interesting to go over all of the monsters, because I thought, like, how would you even rank the monsters? Like, would you rank them by their symbolism or design or how fun they are to fight, like their battle strategy? Like, how, like, how would you rank them? So I decided to answer my own question, and I'm gonna see how I rank them. This is totally on the fly, so let's just get started. The Air Screamer. Uh, I think that's like a C tier monster, maybe? I don't know. There are a lot of monsters here, actually. I think I'm gonna have to make more tiers. There we go. That looks like the appropriate amount of tiers for how many monsters there are. I named the very last tier after the SpongeBob meme. So yeah, I think the air, air screamers are going in either C or B tier. Yeah, like, I don't know. Their symbolism is kind of weak. Their design is fine, I guess. I mean, it's just like a pterodactyl looking thing. They're not really fun to fight. They're more annoying than anything. But I think that's the point. I think they're kind of supposed to be annoying. So the developers did a good job if that was if, if that's what they were going for. But honestly, there's nothing really remarkable about this monster. I mean, it, it, it is the first monster in the series you kill, which is pretty cool. But besides that, it's like I, I have no strong feelings about this monster. There is a pretty cool Easter egg near the drawbridge, though. That seems like a reference to Zelda, where if you... uh kill an air screamer, a bunch of baby air screamers will spawn. Kind of like how when you hit a cucko, a bunch of cuckos will spawn. But that's kind of cool. But wait, honestly, you know what? Fuck it, it's going to V tier. Honestly, I talked myself into it. It's the first monster you kill, and there's a cool air screamer near the drawbridge that spawns with your air screamers when you kill it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's fine. And yeah, B tier, why not? The hang scratchers are going into S tier. I love this monster. This is the scariest thing in Silent Hill 1. I am being serious. So you enter the sewer and it's all dark and ominous and your radio isn't working. And then you hear this moan, this creepy moan. It's horrifying. It is the scary. It's one of the scariest things in the series. And the moan is coming from this monster. I love it. Yeah, they're scary and they're also fun to deal with. I kind of like how they have like no health so you can just like kill them really quickly if they get in your way. But they're also, they're, they're also not a pushover either. Like these enemies do a lot of damage and they're fast. But yeah, two rifle shots and they're dead. Nothing to worry about. A very scary monster. And if it's your first time playing, these guys might rip you a new one because first time players don't know that this enemy has a very low health value. So they might think, oh no, I should avoid that. And, and they try to avoid it, but they can't avoid it because they're super fast and they do a lot of damage. So I do like these enemies a lot. Just their design. I like how they hang on the ceiling. I like their rarity. They only appear in the sewer. And I like how they make the level. Like when you think of the Silent Hill 1 sewer, you think of this enemy, which I think adds merit to this enemy. All right, the mumbler is going into a tier i do like the mumbler i like their design a lot more than the gray children and i like their rarity in the ntsc release like i like how there's only like five of them in the sewer and and that's it in the entire game so i like how rare they are and these things have a lot of health they have the highest health value of any non-boss enemy in the game in the american release in the in the european and japanese releases they have normal health but yeah i like them uh, they're fine, and uh, yeah. I honestly don't really think there's much to say about them. Puppet Sybil is... Uh, honestly, I like Sybil. I, I like Puppet Sybil. I think she's going in A tier. I like how she rides on the merry-go-round. That's really cool. And I like how her boss theme is the merry-go-round. I love that. It doesn't really sound like any other song in the game. It just sounds like an amusement park ride. And I like how she drops the gun after she runs out of 10 bullets. That's such a cool detail. And I like the story importance, you know? You can either save Sybil or you can kill her. And it changes the ending. And I like her plot significance as well because, you know, she got a parasite just like all the nurse enemies. So it kind of makes you wonder, like, where are these parasites coming from? Like, are these parasites the same parasite that grew into the moth boss? Like, who knows? So yeah, she's a cool boss fight. 
uh, no real symbolism behind her. She's just Papa Sybil. And uh, yeah, she's cool. Um, if I, I haven't talked about the mumbler symbolism, but it's just uh, he's a fairy tale monster because the last one likes fairy tales, and I don't know, symbolism is fine. But yeah, I do like a puppet symbol. She's going in A tier. Incubus, the final boss. Oh boy, uh huh. Final boss is right. This is one hell of a monster. He can kill you really quickly, even on easy mode. Like, this guy is really no joke. I kind of like how anime RPG-esque he is, if, if that makes sense. Like, you know, in RPG games, you typically have a flying winged entity as a final boss. And you get that in Silent Hill, which I love. <laughs> But yeah, this monster, no joke. This is one hell of a final boss. I love how he like rises out of the incubator slowly. And even though the graphics are dated and you can't see the emotion on the character's faces, you can just, you can feel what Harry is feeling in that cutscene as the incubus rises. It's hard to explain, but when you're watching that cutscene, you can just feel Kaufman and Harry go, oh fuck, this is it. Honestly, this is a great way to end the game, in my opinion. Uh, SSSSS plus tier. And yes, I named the top tier SSSSS plus because I thought it was kind of funny. So yeah, I think this boss fight beautifully encompasses everything that came before it. You know, you learned throughout the game how to do swift movement into, and, and, and how to avoid enemies. And this boss fight puts that to the test. This boss fight will shoot down lightning, and you have to be perfect to avoid it. Then you have to take quick aim and then shoot at it, just like all the other enemies in the game. So this boss fight takes everything you've learned previously and applies it to the boss fight. You gotta wait for your opening to attack, you gotta be patient, or you can spam health drinks, that's also an option. And yeah, it's kind of fun. And Silent Hill 1 is a very cult-centered game, so what better thing to be the end boss than a cult deity demon thing? Yeah, I just think he's great as the final boss, but if he was not the final boss, if he was like the second to last boss, he'd be like in like S or A tier. But I think he's just such a good way to end the game that he's in a SSSSS plus tier. The Grey Child. Okay, the Grey Child is going in S tier. Not because of its design or symbolism. I, I couldn't really care about that, honestly. I think it's whatever. The reason why it's going in S tier is because of the sound design on this enemy. This is one of the scariest sounding enemies in all of Silent Hill. I think it's probably scarier than the than the Hang Scratcher. Yeah, yeah, it is scarier than the, than the Hang Scratcher. Um, this enemy is haunting just it's sound design it, it's so it's haunting it, it's like a i don't know it's just like a whimpering echoing thing it sounds horrifying it sounds sad and in pain and it sounds like it wants to hurt you and it sounds like it doesn't want to hurt you at the same time it sounds conflicted this is great sound design Th this is great storytelling and sound design this is this enemy is something else. When you walk into the school courtyard for the first time and you hear the whimpering in the distance, even though you already heard it in the alley before at the start of the game, for some reason it's scarier the second time around. The second time you hear it, after hearing it in the alley in the school courtyard, you're like, oh boy, this is it. The first time, the, the first time you're playing Silent Hill 1, that moment gets everybody. This enemy is really no joke. The developers, or Akira Yamoka, when he was doing the sound design, he was like, yeah, that'll get them good. And I kind of wish they just gave the uh, the mumbler the same sound design, because I think European and Japanese gamers missed out on how this enemy sounds and what the sound that this enemy adds to the school does to the school, because it changes the level completely. It makes it horrifying. I think the mumbler has a scarier design than the gray child, but the Grey Child is scarier overall just because of the sounds it makes. It's horrifying. All right, we got the, uh, the, the... I forgot what this thing is called. Oh my god. This thing's going in the C tier. 
I can't remember if this thing's called Twin Feeler or if that's the name of the Moth Boss. Is the Moth Boss called Twin Feeler? Are they both called Twin Feeler? Honestly, this should just be one monster, honestly, because because this is basically one monster. So I should put them in the same tier because I consider them the same thing. Like, I don't really differentiate them in my head. So... Uh, okay, so I would put this in C tier. But I would put this in A or B tier. You know, I'm gonna put this in B tier. I think it's cool, you know, a giant moth. I love insects, you know, dragonflies are my favorite animal. I love dragonflies, so I love insects. And I like how it's a giant moth thing, you know, but uh, honestly, it, it's not that interesting, honestly. It is scary. You know, when you first play Silent Hill and you walk up on top of the roof and uh, the big old moth appears, you know, that's scary. You're like, oh my God, it's a giant moth. That's that's bigger than any other enemy in the game up to this point. Like, oh my gosh, that's horrifying, right? But this boss fight is kind of frustrating. Like you strafe and then you shoot and then you strafe and then you shoot and its attacks are pretty easy to avoid, but sometimes it's just unavoidable. Like sometimes in fighting this boss, a dumb interaction or something will happen where you just like can't avoid damage. Basically, this enemy attacks in three different directions and you have to make sure you are in between the three directions to not take damage. Like sometimes you can just breeze by this boss fight without taking a single hit, no thoughts about it, like brain dead boss fight, right? And then other times when you're fighting it, it's just, it hits you like four times for some reason. And I'm like, damn, why am I doing so poorly? I was, I was playing so good up to this point. I usually beat this boss fight without taking damage and now I'm taking a whole bunch of damage, why? And it's because the way the boss fight moves and the way it attacks is just kind of counterintuitive. I know I'm overcomplicating it, but like it flies back and forth and left and right. And you need to take into the consideration it's flying and you need to add that to the fact that it shoots in three different directions. So I have so many directions you're thinking of. And I don't know if you're not, if, if you're not paying attention, this boss fight can actually hit you a lot of times. And this is what I see in Let's Plays. Whenever I watch someone play Let's Play of this game, uh, typically they do pretty good. They're not taking much damage. They're playing smoothly. Some of the puzzles confuse them, but they get by. Some of the enemies got them good, but they still get by, you know, they take a lot of damage, but they're still doing good. And then the Let's Player gets to this boss fight. And what usually happens is that they take a lot of damage. Like they'll shoot it and then it'll sting at them and they'll be like, oh my gosh, you can sting? And then they'll try to avoid the sting by going a little bit to the left or the right. And then the boss fight will spit at them to the left or to the right. And they'll be like, oh, I just got hit by the thing. I just, it, it, it just spit at me. And I don't know. I think there's merit to having a boss fight that you kind of need to think less about to make it easier. Because if you overthink this boss fight, it can actually, you can get hit a lot. But if you don't overthink it, that's usually when you don't get hit. Man, I've been talking about this enemy a lot. Th this is, this is a complicated enemy is what I'm saying. Basically, I like this enemy when I'm not thinking about it too hard, but when I am thinking about fighting it, I just get I just get hit a lot, and I don't know why. When, when I overthink this boss fight, it just hits me a lot. I need to turn off my brain to fight it. And also, I don't like the, the, the weird health system it has. Like, you have to wait to, to shoot it because it has a period where it buffers the damage you sh you you give it and that's not like any other enemy in the game so if, so if you're fighting it for the first time you'll just be pumping ammo into it and it will not die but if you shoot it slower which is what you have to do you have to shoot it slowly it dies quicker so you'll be fighting this boss fight not knowing that you're wasting so much ammo on it so the optimal way to fight this boss fight is don't think about it and shoot slowly <laughs> Am I the only one who experiences this issue with this boss fight? Where if I think about fighting it, I get hit a lot. But when I don't think about fighting it, I don't get hit. Yeah, anyway, yeah, it's going into B tier. I think it's, it, you know, it's fine. It's a big old insect. That's kind of cool. And its little counterpart is going in the same tier as it because I basically consider them the same exact monster. Incubator. This is the other final boss. I like how it's like a glowy ghostly heavenly figure that's kind of cool like i like its design a lot but the fight is not as good as a uh, incubus in my opinion 
It's definitely not as strong as Incubus. No way. It, it does not do as much damage at all. And it's lightning is way easier to avoid. I do like the blue lightning though. That's kind of cool. Also, I like the implication it adds to the bad ending. On the bad ending, you know, Harry dies in the car accident. And the final boss is him basically killing the godlike version of his daughter. So could it be seen as him fearing that he killed his daughter in the car crash? Oh, how's that for a theory? I don't know. I'm, I'm overthinking it, but yeah, it's fine. Not as good as Incubus. I feel like the developers really tried to make Incubus like one hell of a final battle with the music and everything, but they didn't even give Incubator that good music. Her, her music is not final boss music at all she doesn't feel like a final boss i like her design though i like how she's like the most direct depiction of a heavenly god we see in silent hill usually gods in silent hill look like this fucked up thing but in this instance you get a more heavenly more idealized version of it is she good or evil you will never know she's basically whatever you want her to be she tried to kill Harry, but maybe she only tried to do that because Harry was shooting at her. And honestly, yes, yeah, it's, it's just a tragic, sad, weird boss fight. And it's kind of creepy, especially with like the endings that it's tied to, you know, like this is this is God. I guess I guess the bad guys won. Is she good or bad? Is, is Harry dead? Is is Cheryl dead? Is Cheryl a god now? Like, 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 like what happened? This boss fight really messes with players' heads when they first play. And I think this boss fight has merit on that alone. But I really, I, I don't think it's as good as Incubus at all. Yeah, I think if it's good in like high A or low S, honestly. The Romper. Honestly, this is just a grounded version of the Air Screamer in my eyes. I really don't think this monster is that interesting. It is about as annoying as Air Screamers. They have about the same amount of health. The battle strategy is basically the same. Either you just like run like hell or you shoot them before they get to you. It's just a grounded Air Screamer, honestly. I, I, I kind of like its symbolism though. I, I like how it's like how adults can be viewed by children you know like a lot of adults are unaware but they can be seen as harsh and abrasive to kids even when they're not meaning to at all and yeah i like this boss fight symbolism i'm not boss fight i like i like this enemy symbolism but it, it it it's just a grounded air screamer honestly the creeper i will rank the creeper when i get the silent hill 2 the groaner is really fun to fight. I like how you can just avoid them by backing up. That's fun. I like how when you shoot them in the middle of a lunge, that does insane damage. I like that. That's that's fun. But they're just kind of a generic, creepy looking dog thing. I do not think they're any more interesting than the dogs from Resident Evil 1. And yeah, I mean, the B tier. They're fun to fight though. They are fun to kind of deal with. I like how they don't do that much damage at all. In fact, they barely do any damage. So they, they are kind of fun to just go in and deal with, but yeah. But yeah, most generic looking enemy in the game, honestly. Honestly, my favorite thing about this enemy isn't even anything about it in Silent Hill 1. My favorite thing about this enemy is that there is an Easter egg of it in Silent Hill 3. So uh, yeah, honestly. The puppet nurse is... This is actually a pretty complex enemy. Like, this enemy has, like, really complicated behavior for a uh, 1989 PS1 game. Like, this enemy can grab you and gang up on you. It can, like, grab you for another enemy to attack you. So when you're grabbed, other nurse enemies will be smart enough to not grab you. Instead, they'll slash you while you're grabbed. Like a nurse will go, oh, he's already grabbed. Instead of grabbing him myself, I can just slash him, which is crazy that these enemies are smart enough to do that. Yeah, they gang up on you. They literally hold you down so other nurses can knife you. That is kind of crazy for a 1999 
PS1 game. It's going into S tier because of that alone. Like that behavior is so impressive to me. Like you don't see that in any other Silent Hill enemy. Even in any of the other Silent Hill games, you don't see that kind of AI. Enemies don't strategically gang up on you like the nurses in Silent Hill 1 do. So yeah, it's going into S tier. Now I can finally move on to Silent Hill 2 with the creeper. I like that they're in Silent Hill 2 at all. Like I, like I kind of like when Silent Hill games reuse monsters. Like it shows that maybe previous inhabitants of Silent Hill, maybe people who are previously trapped in the other world have part of their psyche trapped in Silent Hill forever and their psyche can leak into other psyches. So you have Alessa and her other world is leaking in the James other world with the creeper. And I like that a lot. I like their implication in Silent Hill 2. So while their implication is really cool, I don't think the enemy itself is really cool, even though I love insects. So it's going into C tier. <laughs> it's, it's just not cool. It's kind of boring, honestly. Also, the bug room is the worst room in the game. Honestly, okay, fuck it, D tier. The, the bug room is the worst room in the game, so it's going into D tier. The room where you have to dial on the keypad and, and, the, and, the, and the bugs are there, it's, it, it's a dumb room. There is no way to avoid damage in that room. You either don't take damage or you do, which is dumb. I don't think any damage should be forced on the player. I think, you, I think if you're good enough, you should be able to avoid all damage, but creepers don't allow that. Creepers will damage you no matter what sometimes and there is no avoiding it the only way to avoid it is to either get lucky or reload the save so it's yeah d tier the lying figure is uh also kind of iconic in a weird way i like their symbolism i like the you know like a it's like a straight jacket you know like it's like a, it's like a mental patient trapped in their own skin you know trying to escape they're very uh weird and sexualized and i like how they squirm all over the floor when when you down them that's pretty cool the lying figure appearing from under the van before you get the keys to go to the apartments is one of the scariest moments in the game like that moment's a, a really good moment uh i'm gonna put an a tier i don't think it's quite s tier but it is a cool scary monster that i'm gonna get disliked for this that overstays its welcome there are so many of these things and they they have like deceptively long range like their acid attack like like sometimes there's really no avoiding that and it can be a little bit annoying so they're cool but they do overstay their welcome like the game is littered with these things the mannequin is a really cool enemy this enemy is really smart this enemy actually acts different than other silent hill 2 enemies so when you kill an enemy in Silent Hill 2 and its hitbox is still active, a, a, an enemy will not, or, or typically will not be smart enough to walk around the enemy. What I'm trying to say is that you can block an enemy from getting to you by standing in front of an enemy's corpse. But mannequins are smarter. A mannequin will walk around an enemy's corpse and still get to you. It's weird, mannequins have really smart pathfinding AI and it feels smarter than other enemies AI like these enemies act differently than other enemies in Silent Hill 2 they they do it's subtle but once you notice it you can't unnotice it it feels like this enemy is like sensing its surroundings it feels like the other enemies have eyes but this enemy doesn't have eyes so it kind of gets around using echolocation. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, just the way this enemy path finds, it, it, it feels different than other enemies, okay? I'm just making theories as to how it does that, but it feels like, I don't know. Just, I don't know, it's really creepy how this enemy has no head, but it's still smarter than other enemies. That's terrifying honestly and it's going in the top of s tier because of that it's like why is this enemy so smart what does it know i don't know and we'll never know and it's going into s tier your mid head is cool i like him better of a spear honestly the dual pyramid heads on hard mode is the most anal boss in the series 
like to do that boss fight you have to do it in such a specific way like you have to hold the camera button and you have to use the rifle if you don't do that you're getting hit you could try to do the really tricky and precise great knife method but good luck but i kind of like how anal it is like i i kind of i kind of like that fight on hard mode it's hard to explain but the way you fight it just kind of feel symbolic just having to hold that camera button and having to use the rifle and having to do it in such a specific precise way it feels like an allegory for the game in a way like james had to go through silent hill using such a specific route that was laid out for him by the town i don't know i'm way overthinking it i know that's not the intention but it's just how it feels and I like how the artist is proud of his work. You know, uh, Masahiro Ito has the Silent Hill Homecoming Pyramid Head, if I can find him on here. I can't find him right now, but Masahiro Ito uses the Homecoming Pyramid Head as his profile picture. So I kind of like that, you know, like the designer himself of this monster uses him as his icon, which, which is cool. And it's one of the only monsters that is directly referenced in the series. This monster is named in Silent Hill 2. In Silent Hill 2, the words Pyramid Head appear. That never happens with monsters. Other monsters are not named in the game. That, that just doesn't happen. Other Silent Hill protagonists are like, hey, did you see that weird creepy thing? But James is like, uh, did you see that red pyramid thing? Like, you know he saw Pyramid Head. So yeah, this monster's symbolism is beautiful. It's important since in the plot is beautiful. I kind of like how the final fight with it on hard mode feels weirdly symbolic with how you fight it. And I like how it's named in the game. That's cool. And uh, yeah, I think I think this monster is novel because it's just, it, it stands out with, with other monsters. It, it even stands out against other boss fights because this monster has a demeanor and intelligence to it, similar to the mannequins that is different than other monsters. This monster feels like it's doing its job. Other monsters feel like they're just monsters being monsters, like, yeah, I'm a monster. But Pyramid Head is not that. Pyramid Head is doing his duty, his purpose. And I like that a lot. And uh, I guess I'm gonna put it in S tier, yeah, sure, why not? Flesh Lips is C tier. It's fine. Um, it, it's it's in my opinion the least interesting designed monster in the game. It's just a uh, fleshy flesh thing. It's honestly generic looking, even for 2001 standards. You know, the symbolism is good, but all the Silent Hill 2 monsters symbolisms are good. But this monster is just, you know, the fight is fine. The design is fine, I guess. Um, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's whatever. The Mandarin is cool and it's going in uh, A tier. I like the Mandarin. I like its symbolism a lot. This monster has really, really interesting symbolism. So this monster symbolizes feelings of overwhelming and comprehensible anguish. For this reason, it is not permitted to stand above ground. That's so meaningful. Like when you're like the depressed or sad, like it, it, sometimes it feels like you can't get your head above water. And I don't know that 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 symbolism is cool to me. And then in Silent Hill 3, you have the closer, which is now standing above ground. And these are basically the same exact monster, so you have a counterpart here. One symbolizes anguish below ground, and then you have the one in Silent Hill 3, which has ambiguous symbolism, but it is above ground. So it could tie into Silent Hill 3's theme of letting go of the past. Silent Hill 2 was a very depressing game where characters dwelled on the past. The monster was previously anguished and below ground. And then Silent Hill 3 comes along, and Heather, well, sp spoiler alert, but Heather moves on from the past, and the closer is now above ground. I may be overthinking it, but these games are supposed to be overthought, and yeah, I think that's cool, and it's going into A tier because I wish there was more of them. If there were a million of these in the game, it would be S, 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 S. No, I'm just joking, honestly. The reason why it's an A tier is because they're 
cheap. There, this is a cheap enemy. Oh my god. Oh fuck. Oh fuck. That enemy does a lot of damage, like, like ridiculous damage, and it, and it, and, it, and it just hit me twice. In fact, a lot of people don't even know that enemy can't hurt you. No! F Shut! With my fourth run, however, a miracle happened. And I ended up not getting hit by Eddie once. Also not getting hit by the two bobs by the hotel. I was having a perfect run up until... Bro, come on! What the... What was that? No way! You can barely fight them. But they can fight you. Don't even bother trying to kill it, honestly. So I like, you know, I like the enemy. I just don't like their their gameplay element. The closer is not an F tier monster. I accidentally put it there and I'm sad. Ideal father. Honestly, I have to disagree with Masahiro Ito here. Masahiro Ito wanted this to be a one time only boss monster and he didn't like how it appeared in the hotel later, but I disagree. I love how it's in the hotel. It makes the hotel 10 times scarier, and that's cool. Like, I think if this boss was a normal boss and never turned into a regular monster, then I don't know, the game wouldn't be as good for it because then you would only have the lion figures, the mannequins, and the nurses, and I, and I guess if you can count this as an enemy, the Mandarin as well, as normal monsters, but you know, this enemy nicely bumps that up to a decent count. And I think this enemy is cool. I like how scary it is. I like the theories it entails. Like it makes you think, it, Angela and James, did they see different things? I know Masahiro Ito confirmed on Twitter that they did see different things, but is that something that he thought up after the fact or is that something that he thought up while making the game? What did Angela really see? So if this is what James saw, not what Angela saw, then is, is this like what James... Is, is this how James viewed Angela's past? And, and, that's, and, and it's not really how Angela viewed her own past? I don't know, there are so many questions about this monster. What Angela saw was probably 10 times more disturbing, and that's really sad. But this is a very interesting monster, and I really like how it appears in the hotel later. That's horrifying, because after you leave the room with the fish key, I think it is, and then you hear a creepy sound in the hallway, you're like, oh my god, what is that? And then you, and then you see that it's the fucking abstract daddy from earlier. That's horrifying. That's like one of the scariest things in the game. So yeah, Masaru Ito, I know you don't like that they're in the hotel, and I'm sorry about that, but the game is better for it, and, and I'm being serious. So yeah, it's creepy, it's fucked up, it's gruesome, it is not beautiful in the slightest, it's sad, it's morbid, it's grotesque, and sometimes Silent Hill does not need to be pleasant or beautiful or any of those things. Sometimes it can just be incredibly fucked up. And this monster chose that distastefully, and that's great. Mary. Look, I'm gonna call this Mary from now on. I don't care if it's Maria in most of the endings, this is Mary to me. Like, look, she is Maria technically in most of the endings, but when she turns into the boss, that's Mary. That's the final boss. And she's going to the SSSSS plus tier. This is, and a lot of people don't know this, but this is probably the hardest Silent Hill boss. I play these games on hard mode, by the way, so, that, so that's how I'm judging it. And hard mode Maria is ridiculous. Her health value is crazy. Like she has the health of the two pyramid heads before her combined. So you take the health of one pyramid head, another pyramid head, and you put together, and, and that's Mary's health value. She takes forever to kill. In older Silent Hill 2 hard mode speedruns, hard mode Maria took up a third of the entire run. That's how ridiculous she is. And people typically don't know how hard she is because usually when they get to her, they have a whole bunch of health and a whole bunch of ammo. They, they can just brute force her. But if you actually try to strategically do this boss fight properly, 
it is not that easy. And again, I'm talking about hard mode Maria. Okay, I know she's a pushover on normal mode, but we're not talking about that. So yeah, Mary, her transformation before the battle is one of the coolest moments in the series. So she turns upside down and she kind of glitches out. That is really cool. I love the implication there. So my theory on that moment where she's glitching out before she turns into Mary for real, I believe that symbolizes that Silent Hill's power is waning. James realizes what he has done. He doesn't need Pyramid Head anymore. The hotel is not nice anymore. The hotel is now how it should look, pretty much. Reality is coming back to James. And I like to see Maria glitching out before she turns into Mary, possibly symbolizing that Maria is channeling the very last energy that Silent Hill has before it dissipates all the way. And it's showing how corrupted the town has become. And I like how she looks like a nun and also an upside down cross. Like, what does that mean? Okay, so my entire computer just reset randomly and for no reason. So I had to re-rank everything, kinda. And I think this is what I had previously. I think this is accurate to the original ranking. I put Puppet Sybil above the Mumbler. And I don't know, there might be some little changes here and there, but it should all still be pretty much the same. Also, I forgot to examine Splithead. I mean examine, I forgot to rank Splithead. And Splithead is going into SSSSSSS plus tier. I love this monster. This, th this monster is one of the coolest like introductions ever. Like this area is amazing looking for a PS2 game. I love how you go in the basement and then the and then you see the symbolic Alessa in the middle of the room with the fire. That's really cool. And then the the split head or the double head or whatever it's called comes out from behind the fire. That is so cool. This area is like the boss arena for this is really cool and I like how when you defeat it the room becomes all hazy. It's symbolic. It is one of the most symbolic boss fights in the series because it is almost a direct retelling of what happened to Alessa. Alessa was burnt in the basement of her house and then she split her soul in two. And then the same thing happens with this boss fight. With this boss fight, you go to the basement of the school. You see a figure in the middle of the room who is kind of dressed like how Alessa is at the end of the game. And that figure is on fire and then Splithead, who splits its mouth, starts to fight you. And it's just it, it's it's just a beautifully symbolic moment. Well, it's, it's not beautiful. It's kind of morbid, but it's a symbolic moment. And it, it might not be that subtle, but it, it's still incredibly effective. And it's an amazing first boss fight. And I love it. I can't believe I just skipped right over it and going over the Silent Hill 1 monsters. Oh, well. All right, I think we can go over Silent Hill 3 now with the Closer, and I'm gonna rank it with the Mandarin. I already kind of went over the Closer when I was going over the Mandarin, but I like how they're counterparts. I like how they're kind of the same monster, kind of like with the Creepers in Silent Hill 1 and 2. I like how we have a returning monster here, and I like how its symbolism and meaning and character kind of changes as well. Like, it's not really the Mandarin anymore. It's not exactly the same monster but it definitely takes inspiration so it can be seen as you know silent hills otherworldly power leaking into i mean leaking into other other worlds and stuff you know like james's james's mandarin is now in alessa's other world which i think is really cool the numb body is fine i mean i guess i guess c tier is appropriate for the numb body the coolest thing about the numb body is the first time you see it, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know, when you're first playing the Silent Hill games, and you first play Silent Hill 1 and then Silent Hill 2, and then you go into Silent Hill 3 blind, you know, you saw all of the monsters from Silent Hill 1 and 2, so you're thinking to yourself, ooh, I wonder what new monsters are going to be in this game. And you see the Mandarin from Silent Hill 2, and you see the dogs that are kind of like the dogs in Silent Hill 1, and you think, oh, they're that, 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 that's kind of cool that's neat and then you see the numb body and you're like oh wow that's a new monster that's an interesting monster that's a weird sperm like creature thing so yeah it's cool in the sense that when you're first playing Silent Hill 3 and you come across this monster it, it, it is unique looking it is like a pinker shade than monsters typically are 
and it kind of acts a little differently too. They kind of like skip a little bit when they run. But besides the novelty of seeing them for the first time, they're really not that interesting, honestly. The most interesting thing about this monster is the behavior. Sometimes it just freezes completely in place, which is weird. Like all of its animations just stop and it just becomes frozen in place. That's kind of interesting. But yeah, on hard mode, they're really annoying. And on normal mode, they're just like whatever. The pendulum is going in. Okay, I don't like this monster at all. This is one of the cheapest, dumbest enemies in the series. If you remember the clip I showed with the mandarins earlier, how they how they would hit you under the floor and it was really dumb. This is like that, except getting hit by them is way more common. They are way more common and they're aerial and their range is ridiculous and they make a really annoying high pitch sound effect. And when you try to fight them, they rapidly increase in speed and lunge towards you. And sometimes they're completely invincible. Sometimes you cannot fight them. So run like hell and wish yourself luck if you ever see one. What's the symbolism? I don't know. I don't care. It's, it's in tier, okay? I, I, I couldn't care less. Oh my gosh, I just realized Eddie isn't here. Eddie. There we go. That's where Eddie goes. <laughs> also, another thing about the pendulum is that sometimes they don't even count. Sometimes you'll kill one and it won't even get added to your ranking. What? Just to really hone in how annoying these things are, I'm going to show an annoying clip of them. Hopefully this pendulum does not bother you. Oh god. Yeah, this can happen. This can happen. Okay, that's unfortunate. When that pendulum starts hitting you on the stairs at the amusement park, don't even bother trying to fight it. Just, just run, just take the damage, and that's your best option. Okay, now we're going over the slurper. Yeah, I honestly see tier, honestly. I guess it is fun that you can distract them with beef jerky, and they are kind of fun to fight with the mall. But if you don't know what you're doing against this enemy, it can be really troublesome like this enemy really is not that bad this enemy is not as annoying as people think it is but i can still see why people have issues with this monster because you know you have to have the beef jerky gotta turn your flashlight off if you missed the mall not the location the weapon you know if you if you don't have any of that then you're kind of screwed pretty much also, you have to go slow with this enemy. You know, you have to lay down the beef jerky. You gotta use the mall. You gotta, you, you need to play around this enemy. So when you're speed running, you're not gonna have any fun with this enemy. This is a speedrunner's worst nightmare. Casually, they're really not that bad. They're actually pretty fun casually, but speed running is just, ugh. But even casually, like I said, there's still a trouble if you don't know what you're doing. First time players are not going to know how to properly deal with these things, you know? Also, I, I've had people tell me that beef jerky just will not work for them. Like I'll have people message me saying, you know, I do what you do in the videos, but even if I, even when I lay down a beef jerky or when I turn my flashlight off or when I use the mall, nothing works. So some people out there are playing this game and none of the strategies that they're doing that are supposed to work are working. And I can imagine that that's incredibly frustrating. So it's going in like low C, high D for me. Personally, I think they're kind of fun, but I'm not going to ignore the trouble that they give some players and the trouble that they give speedrunners. Split head is, um, wait, is this split worm or split head? Is this split head or split worm? I can't remember the names. I guess it doesn't matter. Either way, this is like the Silent Hill 3's counterpart to the Silent Hill 1 first boss fight. So, uh, I, I don't really like this boss fight that much. Just, I don't know. I, I get it. You know, it's a direct sequel to Silent Hill 1. So they wanted the boss fights to be 
kind of like continuations of the Silent Hill 1 boss fights. But just, just genuinely just this boss fight, there, there's not much to say about it, honestly. It has some of the most obvious and direct symbolism of any Masahiro Ito monster, so that's kind of... And it's kind of goofy looking. Like, when you first start Silent Hill 3, you really are not expecting to see anything like this in the game. It looks kind of cartoony, in my opinion, actually. Like, I get it, you know, the symbolism, you know, I, I, I understand its purpose, you know, I get it. I think the introduction to the boss is kind of cool, how Heather just kind of knows it's there before it appears, like how she looks behind her at, at, at nothing, and then it kind of jump scares you. But besides that, it's just... Yeah, it's it's just a whatever monster is going into low C. One of one of the one of the most eh kind of boss fights, I guess. The insane cancer is cool and it's going in A tier. I like this monster. Okay, this monster is terrifying. I love this monster. One of my favorite moments in Silent Hill 3, and one of my favorite moments in the franchise. I'll never forget this is playing this game for the first time and you enter that train car and you pick up the shotgun, right? So you pick up that shotgun, it's in a birthday basket. You're like, why is that there? Did someone give it to me, who knows? And then you hear this creepy growl, this weird noise off in the distance. And you're like, I, it, it, it was probably nothing. You know, you think it was probably nothing, you know? And then you, and then you exit the train car and the static gets louder. And you look on the ground, and there's just this weird, bulbous, massive monster just lying there on the ground. And it's the insane cancer. That's amazing. That's genius. It's going at the very top of A tier. And I really like the Easter egg where you fight the insane cancer, and Heather starts talking like an anime girl. And the insane cancer starts talking with like a ro robotic voice. I think that's really cool. And I like the secret insane cancer at the construction site after you jump down with the mattress and it sometimes has that weird sound that plays a fit. I like that insane cancer, that one's really cool. So yeah, I just think that this is a monster that Team Silence used very effectively. I like how this monster usually appears in areas where they weren't before. Like usually you would run down a hallway and then there would be no insane cancers and then you would need to run down that hallway again later in the dungeon and there would be an insane cancer there. And I like how this insane cancer, I like how the developers make it so you have to run by them. I love that. That's scary. Like the shotgun shells at the next to the fridge in Hilltop. That's a cool insane cancer placement. You're like, ooh, I want those shotgun shells, but there's a freaking insane cancer right there. Ah, so yeah, this is a really effectively used monster. High A or low S. Um... Yeah, I guess, I guess it deserves low S. The reason why I'm not putting it like higher is because I don't think its design itself is that interesting. But I think what they do with the monster is interesting. So yeah, like low S, uh, high A probably. Okay, which one of these is the missionary and which one of these is the scraper? Why is there a distinction between these two monsters, but there isn't a distinction between the big abstract daddy and the mini abstract daddy in Silent Hill 2. Okay, this monster is going in the top tier. Like, this is a great monster right here. In my opinion, this is probably the most ambiguous monster in Silent Hill 3. Because, you know, you know, Vincent, he's like, oh, they, they look like monsters to you? And then Heather's like, D -d 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 -d. but like, this monster really puts that question to the test. Because this monster, really no one knows if this was a monster or if this was just a normal guy that uh, Claudia hired to kill Harry, you know? I like to imagine that this was just a normal missionary assassin that Heather saw as a monster and she killed in self-defense. That's what I like to imagine personally, but it's really up to the player to decide. This is a cool monster. It looks badass. He has badass double swords. He's really cool. And uh, yeah, he's doing SSSSS plus tier because this monster is just a freaking badass, okay? And they're fun to fight. I, I, I like fighting them. I do think that the missionary is a fun boss fight and I think scrapers are kind of fun to deal with. And the scariest thing in Silent Hill 3, in my opinion, is the moments where you enter Harry's room in the Otherworld Church or chapel and then you exit Harry's room 
and then there's a scraper right there right as you exit in my opinion that is the scariest thing in the game and that's genius and sssss plus tier hell yeah memory of alessa this is definitely one of the coolest set pieces in the game i love the merry go round i love how it's like spiraling downward a lot of people don't notice that but next time you fight this boss fight look at the walls the merry-go-round itself is like spiraling through the earth it's really cool so yeah i like this monster going in uh, s tier really cool monster i really wish this was a skin for heather you could unlock that would be really cool but unfortunately it's not it's only reserved for the boss but yeah it's just a beautifully symbolic boss fight and i like how it reuses the imagery from the split head boss fight that's really really cool because during the split head boss fight you had alessa burning in the middle of the room well symbolically and then during the Memory of Alessa boss fight here, you also have her burning in the middle of the room. It's subtle, but it is there. You have to kind of look out for it, but she is there, and that's really cool. And uh, yeah, really cool boss fight. I find it funny how Eddie was kind of a step back from Sybil, because in my opinion, Sybil did not feel awkward at all. Sybil just felt like a normal boss monster, and neither does Memory of Alessa. But then Eddie in Silent Hill 2 comes along. He feels so awkward and janky to fight. It's like, what happened there? You think they would have improved from Sybil in Silent Hill 1, but no, Eddie was like a weird mechanical step down from that boss fight. But luckily they regained their footing and fixed it with their Silent Hill 3 uh, humanoid boss monster. So yeah. The Silent Hill 3 nurse is my favorite nurse and it's going in high S. Uh, is it is it better than the gray child? Eh, yeah, sure, I think it is. Wait a minute, what the fuck? I just realized there are any Silent Hill 2 nurses here. Where's the Silent Hill 2 nurse? Is that the Silent Hill 2 nurse? That looks like the Origins nurse. What the fuck is this? Is this the nurse? I have no idea what this even is. Am I dumb or is the Silent Hill 2 nurse really not here? No offense to whoever put this together, but how do you include the Origins nurse but forget to put the Silent Hill 2 nurse? Actually, I think a lot of monsters might be missing here. Oh boy. You know what? If anybody notices any monster missing, then you can just comment and I might respond with how I feel about that monster. Anyway, the Silent Hill 2 nurse would go in a B or C tier. I don't know, their movements are kind of freaky and interesting, but besides that, the Silent Hill 2 nurse is, means nothing to me. The Silent Hill 2 nurse is just not as interesting as the Silent Hill 1 nurse. Their behavior definitely isn't as interesting. Like the Silent Hill 1 nurse can hold you and have other nurses knife you. That's really interesting behavior. But the Silent Hill 2 nurse is just really, really aggressive. I don't like what they did to the nurse in Silent Hill 2. Like the nurse in Silent Hill 2 got such a crazy buff. Like they're incredibly aggressive. There's really no avoiding them. You have to fight them. But I mean, the symbolism is there. They are symbolic and they have interesting facial design like they have like a kind of like a baby mask kind of it's kind of weird but i mean yeah they're i mean yeah their design is fine but they would go in b or c tier because i don't think they're that interesting and i think that they're incredibly overly aggressive and i don't like how much they were buffed but the reason why i like the Silent Hill 3 nurse so much we're we're now back to the Silent Hill 3 nurse the, the Silent Hill 3 nurse is my favorite nurse in the series i love the Silent Hill 3 nurse one of the scariest, most shocking things in any Silent Hill game is playing Silent Hill 3, and you need to play Silent Hill 2 to understand this, but it's playing Silent Hill 3 after playing Silent Hill 1 and 2, and you enter the hospital, and you're like, oh my god, there are nurses, and it's scary, because as soon as you enter the hospital, the nurses are there, and they're loud, and they're making noises, and you're like, oh fuck, and then you kill the nurses, and you're like, okay, it's fine, and then you go to the top floor, you're like, I mean, not the top floor, but, but, but the floor above you, and we're just and you 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 just walk down the hallway and then all of a sudden you see a fucking nurse with a gun is that not scary i bet anyone who plays this game remembers that they they remember the first time they see a nurse with a gun in this game and they think oh fuck nurses have guns in this game i love that i love it. i love that they have guns and i like how their behavior was changed from silent hill 3 they're not incredibly overly aggressive anymore. You can actually run past them now. And you're probably thinking, what are you talking about? Speedrunners run past Silent Hill 2 nurses all the time. And it's like, yeah, that's because they're playing on easy mode. 
Okay, if you actually try to speed run the game on normal or hard mode, those nurses will kick your ass. But in Silent Hill 3, even on hard mode, you can just run past the nurses. And it's so liberating after playing Silent Hill 2. And this is going to sound weird because it's like a monster. But this is a pretty enemy. Like, I love this enemy's hair and its design. I just think this is a cool, pretty, and interesting enemy. And I love how it's a continuation of the Silent Hill 1 and 2 nurses, you know? Like, they kind of look like the Silent Hill 2 nurse, but they slouch like the Silent Hill 1 nurse. That's interesting to me. And I like their movements. I like their design. It's my favorite nurse in the series. They're iconic. When I think of Silent Hill, I don't think of the Silent Hill 2 nurse. No, I think of the Silent Hill 3 nurse. And I think about the fact that they hold guns. I love that. This is a cool enemy. And it's going at high S tier. God is very cool. I love God. And she is going in S, 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 S plus tier. She is, she is at the very, very top right now. The camera work leading up to this boss fight is so cool and interesting. Like you get this slow zoom of its face and then you see its face get covered up by a cloth. And it's like, you're watching that cutscene and you're like, what does that mean? And what is that? And this really feels like the final boss of Silent Hill. Like, I, like I love this enemy's design. This is such a cool enemy. I like how it looks like a giant Baruko lady, kind of. Just, I don't know, like, earlier in the hospital, you see possibly Lisa in the other world. She has this black hair, and you see Valtiel interacting with these nurses throughout the game, and they have this black hair. It all feels like subtle foreshadowing to this. And they all kind of look like the Furuko lady. You know, Lisa in the hospital, she looked like the Furuko lady. Anyway, I just love how this boss looks like a giant Furuko lady. I love how she has, like, this, like black hair she looks like alessa and maria but she actually looks more like alessa i don't know i just like how so many elements of this boss fight were was was kind of in the previous games because her arms are uh pyramid head's arms her face is maria's face her hair and i, I guess also her face kind of does look like the furuko lady and she also kind of has a little bit of incubus in her and she's just the she's very interesting i like how i like when i i like when final bosses do that i like when a final boss in a game has elements from every previous or like a lot of previous elements in the game it had if that makes sense because it feels like everything was leading up to this moment and i love the idea that this isn't even god this could just be some weird fucked up monster and it could have nothing to do with God. And I love that. Book of Lost Memories even proposed that question. Official Silent Hill Media proposed the question if this was even God. It's perfectly reasonable to assume that it's not God, that it's just some weird creepy monster that serves as the final boss. And it has a bunch of weird elements that are from previous monsters before it and it's massive and has so much health and does a lot of damage. And I like it a lot. I think this is an amazing final boss. Even though this is only the third Silent Hill game, I consider this the final boss of Silent Hill in general. I don't, I don't think anything encapsulates a Silent Hill monster more than this monster. Because of the questions it entails, the buildup, the symbolism, the music, the design, its behavior, everything about this monster is Silent Hill. And it's going in SSSS plus tier. This, this is an amazing monster. And thank God Masahiro Ito didn't have enough time to make this monster look like how he wanted it to look. That's right, apparently the art designer reused assets for this boss fight because he just didn't have enough time to make new assets. But I love that. I think that's a beautiful accident because I think this boss fight is better for it. I think this boss fight is better because it looks like Maria. I think it's better that it looks like the Furuko lady. I think that's better that it reuses Pyramid Head's arms. I think it's better that it's just some weird fucked up amalgamation of everything that came before it. And it even follows the trope that Silent Hill has of things covering its face, you know? Pyramid Head, its face is covered with this big helmet and this thing covers its face with cloth at the very top of the room. And then you defeat it by 
letting it reveal its face to you. That's kind of meaningful because so many things before this boss fight hit its face from you. This is everything that Silent Hill is leading up to and it's beautiful and yeah. Leonard is honestly probably the most generic looking thing in Silent Hill 3. Uh, I think he's generic even for 2003 standards. I'm going to put him in low C tier. Um, I, I guess he's interesting in the sense that he also kind of poses the same question as the scraper and the, and the, uh, oh, what's it called? Oh my God. Oh yeah. The missionary where like, you know, are you killing Leonard or are you killing a monster? Does the, the, the does Heather see Leonard as a monster and she's killing him in self-defense or is she just seeing a monster like version of Leonard? You know, so it, it poses some cool questions. But this boss fight's really annoying. Really, really annoying. Really generic looking. Uh, this boss fight can really eat up your time sometimes. Because sometimes you'll just be trying to hit it. And it will not raise above water. You'll just swim in that water for minutes on end. And it's not very fun at all. And the symbolism is kind of weak, honestly. He's just, he's, he, he's just Leonard. You know, he might be how Claudia viewed her abusive father. So I guess that's kind of interesting, but I don't know. Just, I don't think he's interesting. I think his boss fight's annoying. Yeah, like low. He, he's low, honestly. Very low. You know what, fuck it, I'm putting him in F tier. Okay, the double head is fun to fight similarly to the groaner. Like, I love how you block and then you shoot them and they die in like one hit. That's really satisfying. That even works on hard mode. And they're not as generic looking as the Silent Hill 1 dogs. These dogs actually look somewhat unique for horror game dog enemies and they are fun to fight and their symbolism is kind of weak. I mean, I guess they're just like, they, they like symbolize, you know, like Alessa splitting in two and, and that, but like, yeah, it's cool. Uh, A or B. You know, I guess like high B, low A. They have interesting sound design. I like how they howl. The sniffer dog. Okay, this is the best Silent Hill dog and it's going in S tier. This is such an interesting design. I love this enemy's design. Like the fact that they drink the blood of other enemies like Mosquito is so cool to me. And I like how you can distract them like the slurpers in Silent Hill 3. In Silent Hill 3, you use the beef jerky to distract the slurpers, but in Silent Hill 4, you use other enemies to distract them. So if you ever don't want to deal with a sniffer dog, you just kill a Hummer or another sniffer dog, and then the other sniffer dogs will go over to that dead sniffer dog and start drinking that corpse's blood. That's really interesting. It shows that these enemies do have behavior and intelligence to them. So yeah, I just love the mosquito element to them. I love that. I like how they drink the blood like a vampire, like off of other enemies. That's that's really cool. And it's going in S tier for that. It's just the, it's just one of the more unique and interesting dog enemies in Silent Hill. And I would argue even in horror games in general. And like, I know people don't like how this enemy uses stock sound effects. Like when you step on them, it just does a Jaguar sound. An incredibly generic one too, that everybody's heard. But honestly, I like that. I like how it sounds like a wild cat when you step on it. I think that's interesting and I think it makes them satisfying to step on. And if you don't want to hear that sound, then just don't bother fighting them. You can also walk past them and that will help you avoid them. So yeah, best Silent Hill dog besides Mira. He is a good doggo, the sniffer dog. Cynthia. Oh, this is just the ghost, isn't it? This isn't counting just Cynthia. No, this is encompass this is encompassing every single Silent Hill 4 ghost, isn't it? Oh man, I wish I could rank the ghosts differently because I would rank them differently. Okay, I know a lot of people don't like the ghosts at all, but I love the ghosts and they're going in the top tier. I do like some ghosts more than others, but I just I I think the ghosts are so fun. I know a lot of people don't like the ghosts because they don't know how to deal with them. And even when they do know how to deal with them, they still find them very annoying. But just when you learn how to effectively use holy candles on them, and when you learn how to effectively 
where are those same medallions at the right time. This enemy is actually not a bad enemy at all, and they're very interesting. Like, different ghosts have different behaviors. Could it be symbolic of their personalities and their past lives? I don't know. The boss ghosts are really cool. I like how there are these four ultra-powerful ghosts that you can come across. Like, Richard is such a cool enemy. Like, Richard is so cool. Like, oh my god, Richard's cool. Like, Richard, like, skips and teleports and he, like, walks around and stuff. He's the only ghost in the game that doesn't float, which is really cool. I don't know. I'll never truly be able to explain why I love this enemy so much. But I just think what they add to Silent Hill 4 is so meaningful and so fun. I guess my biggest issue with this monster is how cryptic they are. The game does not explain well at all how to deal with them. But once you know how to deal with them, and once you learn that you can kind of actually kill them without a sort of obedience, once you learn that, they're really not bad at all. In fact, they're kind of fun to deal with. They're just like every other Silent Hill monster, basically. Watch my video on the ghosts if you don't know how they work, but once you realize how they work, they're actually a lot of fun. I'm being serious. They add this beautiful management strategic layer to Silent Hill 4 that really finalizes Silent Hill 4's identity as a survival horror game. Was that pretentious what I just said? Maybe. And it's going in SSSSS plus tier. Okay, these are the wall monsters in the subway. And this is going in like D tier. I can tell the developers had a lot of fun putting all of those wall men there. <laughs> the developers were just like, oh yeah, that'll get them good. Yeah, we should put a million wall men in the, in the, uh, in the, in the escalator part. That'll be hilarious. I don't know. I kind of love it when I get to a part in the game where I can clearly see that the developers were just kind of having fun and dicking around. And it is kind of fun, honestly. It is kind of fun trying to avoid the wall men. But the reason why they're so low is because I just don't like their design at all. Their design is whatever the texture of the wall that they come from is. I don't know, they just feel very lazy. It just looks like a figure not necessarily a scary one either, just a normal figure hanging out of the wall. And they can be annoying, honestly. So it's just, it's uninteresting. It's annoying. They can be fun if you have the right mindset, but it is going in like below C tier, definitely. Incredibly generic design this enemy has. All right, now for the Hummer. If you have the bug spray, this enemy is like low B tier. They are kind of fun to spray, but when you don't have that, they're just a huge waste of time. So it's going in C tier. I like how when this enemy is around, when sniffer dogs are around, you can kill the Hummer and then the sniffer dog will walk over to the Hummer's corpse and that will distract the sniffer dog for you. So that's really cool. And I like how you don't need to worry about them around Eileen because they barely do any damage at all to Eileen. To put into perspective how much you don't need to worry about Hummers with Eileen, Eileen's highest possession value is 1.0. Hummers do maybe 0 0.0006 points of damage to her. So they're really nothing to worry about when taking care of Eileen. So that's kind of nice, but yeah, they are kind of annoying if you don't have the bug spray. So yeah, it's going in like low C. And it's also cool how the Hummers can distract Walter. But I mean, besides all that, this enemy is just, it's whatever. Okay, the twin victim is freaking awesome. And it's going in high S tier. Honestly, maybe SSSSS plus tier. I don't know. Okay, this is going to be an unpopular opinion. I am so thankful that this enemy does not do the high-pitched squeal during gameplay. So, you know, in the opening of Silent Hill 4, the, the music video I'm talking about that plays before the game starts, the, uh, the twin victims have a squeal that's not in the final game. And I've heard it be said a lot that it would have been scarier if they did that squeal, but the pendulums 
are so annoying and they also have a high-pitched sound they do what the fuck i just realized that the stalkers aren't here where are the stalkers from Silent Hill 1 what the fuck anyway um i love how the developers were like you know what we probably shouldn't make another enemy that does incredibly high-pitched wails like the pendulum you should probably tone it down a little bit and in the final game the twin victims instead say ritual or something like that in a really deep voice wait i think they say receiver yeah i think they whisper receiver to you and that's creepy and the creepiest thing about this enemy is that when you defeat them before you kick them they wail like a baby on the floor that is terrifying and the part with the six twin victims at the end of water prison world second time that part is actually not that bad i mean yes it can be frustrating but once you actually practice that part and get good at it you can get good at it i know it seems like a crapshoot like it seems like it's just like a rng filled enemy fest where you have to get lucky to get past it but that's not true if you know how to properly deal with that twin victim room it's it's manageable and it's fine Welcome Dark Warriors, so I'm just going to quickly go over this room just to show that it's not as bad as everybody thinks it is. So I'm going to go over some different strategies here. Alright, give Eileen a weapon. Okay, this is the gun method. The gun will pierce every twin victim here. It kind of functions like the rifle in the previous games and the rifle. The rifle in Silent Hill 1 and 2 could shoot through enemies. And the same thing about the pistol in this game, it can shoot through enemies. So. Make sure they're all clumped up together like that, and then start shooting. As you can see, it's hitting them all at once. We're doing good. Eileen is kind of stuck behind me, but that's fine. Walk up to them, start hitting them. The pistol's really effective against this part. Okay, there we go. All right. We're good. One more enemy. All right, there we go. See, all of them are dead and barely any damage taken at all. All right, next up is the pickaxe method. This one's pretty fun to do. So give Eileen a weapon, equip the pickaxe. And then what you want to do is you want to run to this line on the ground right here. Right here. Okay, wait for Eileen to get to you. All right, Eileen's gonna be bait. All right, have them all run to Eileen. There we go. Okay, now. There we go. There we go. All right. Come on, Eileen. Come on, Eileen. Eileen. Okay. There was another method for you. That one's pretty fun. Yeah, just let just let all the twin victims surround Eileen and then do a big ol' swing. And then bada boom, bada bing, easy twin victim room. Okay, here's another method. This one involves the rifle. This is a good method if the pistol method is not working for you. So this method is a little faster because the revolver will always down every enemy in one hit. So Alright, get the enemies near you. Okay, make sure they all lunge up lunge together like that, and then bam, they're all down. Bam, they're all down. There we go. This is a very effective method. And for the record, all of these methods are in hard mode. These are all hard mode methods. None of this is on normal mode. So if this is all working on on hard mode, then 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 they should work on easy mode as well. I mean, normal mode as well. So yeah, this is these are pretty effective methods. I'm kind of fumbling over my words right now. Okay, there. See, all of them are dead. All of them are gone. Bada boom, bada bing, easy twin victim room. All right, now we're just going to do it old fashioned. We're going to use the axe and the chain. That's right, the best melee weapon for Henry and the best melee weapon for Eileen in the game should make very quick work of these enemies. And this is on hard mode, so if it works on hard mode, then it'll work on every difficulty, but pretty much. So there we go. We, we, we hit three at once there. Oh, beautiful. Oh, they're back up. They're back up. That's not good. All right, gotta get back, lunge back. You're completely invincible during the jumping animation that Henry does. Ah, oh, two at once, beautiful. Get him, Henry. There. Gotta hit him. Ah, oh, man, I'm getting, I'm getting ganged up on. Oh my gosh. 
Hit them all. Hit them all. There we go. Did that one behind Henry? No. Okay, hit that enemy. There we go. We're doing good. Eileen killed that one. Okay. And there. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, come on, Eileen. Eileen, hurry. Oh my gosh, there we go. See, that room is not that bad. It is not... That room is not the end of the world. See, Eileen is still completely unpossessed. Eileen still has no possession on her. See, she's... She's fine. So as long as you make quick work of this room and don't, like, stay in here a long time, Eileen, I, Eileen will be completely okay. Okay, so this room is really not as bad as everybody says it is. In fact, I actually like this room. I think this room is pretty fun, actually. Sorry for that long cutaway there, going over different strategies for the twin victim room. But yeah, this enemy is not as annoying and not as bad as everybody thinks it is. You just have to go into it with the right mindset, and this enemy is an amazing design, and the symbolism is morbid. And yeah, it's cool. It's a cool, scary enemy. You know what? Screw it. I'm putting it in SSSSS plus tier. I have no reason not to put it there. The gum head. Uh, this is like a C tier monster, honestly. Funnily enough, this enemy can be useful to you because there is no drop button in Silent Hill 4. So if you need to get rid of an item, you can just have a gum head hit you and it can take one of your items. So that's kind of niche. That's kind of useful. But it can also be really annoying when it takes an item that you don't want it to take. It has basically the same exact symbolism as the romper from Silent Hill 1, except instead of Alessa, it's Walter this time, and it's Walter's Fear of Adults, or it could symbolize how he views everyone else as being dumb. But yeah, honestly, I have no real strong feelings about this monster. I think its design is kind of generic. I do kind of like the variation of the gum head that's pale with some black on its face. I like that one better than the one that's completely flesh toned. So I do like the other variation of it a little bit, but yeah, it's it, this is like a C tier monster, honestly. Like this monster is competing with the twin victims and the ghosts, okay? And it, it really just doesn't compare. All right, the patient is super underrated. Say what you want about the belching. I unironically think that this might be the scariest thing in Silent Hill 4. So the scariest thing in Silent Hill 4, in my personal opinion, is in the hospital after the cutscene where uh, Henry sees Walter and then Henry leaves the room and then he gained control of Henry and there are a bunch of Hummers in the main hall. So in the previous cutscene, you saw Walter working on a corpse or something. It looks like he was kind of finagling with a dead body. Anyway, you re-enter the room and then the body has come to life. I remember when, I, when that first happened to me, I paused the game and I took a deep breath. That was horrifying. That was one of the scariest things in any Silent Hill game, in my opinion. Like, they are really annoying, and their battle strategy is kind of spammy, and they have a lot of health, and they have ridiculous sound effects, but honestly, this is a great change of pace from the nurse. You know, in Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3, you had the nurse. Well, guess what? This time, you have the patient. You don't have patients in any other Silent Hill game, except for arguably the patient demon, I guess. I don't know, just I think this enemy is in is a adversion of expectations, and I love it. Like, I was expecting a nurse. I wasn't expecting a nine-foot-tall, grotesque demon thing. So say what you want about the sound design of this enemy. It can be seen as kind of goofy. I think this enemy's introduction is incredibly effective. So it's going in a very high A for me. The wheelchair is... Eh, eh. There's a cooler version of this enemy in Silent Hill Origins, but we'll get to that. Basically, this enemy, uh, if you see it in the lights, it kind of casts a shadow of a person. But there isn't enough light in Silent Hill 4 to really get a good view of that. In fact, I don't even really consider this an enemy. This is like a obstacle more than anything. Like, if this is an enemy, then so is the glutton from Silent Hill 3. Like, I don't know, you can't fight them, and they just get in your way, so... It, it just it just doesn't seem like a normal enemy to me. It doesn't really... It, it, it doesn't count, in my opinion. Uh, I, I guess F tier, honestly. Honestly, I would rank the glutton higher than the wheelchair. 
The glutton would be uh, like high B, low A because it's really cool. But yeah, the wheelchair, the only interesting thing about the wheelchair is that you can see it go in and out of rooms in the hospital. So that's pretty cool. And if you enter some rooms in the hospital, it'll, it'll actually spawn more wheelchairs. So that's also pretty cool. But besides that, this enemy is just... You can barely even consider it an enemy. It's just like a... It's it, it, it's an obstacle. It's it's a thing in the way. And when I finally get Eileen in the hospital and all those wheelchairs go away, I just think, thank God every time. All right, the bottom. This enemy is interesting in the fact that its symbolism seems to tie into how... Joseph Schrieber was upside down in the ceiling in uh, Room 302 of the past. And this enemy has an upside down head, kind of like Joseph Schrieber. So is there a connection there? Ah, uh, how about that? That's, that, th there's some theorizing for you. So yeah, I, I like it. I, I like the bottom. Uh, it's going B tier. It's, it's fine. I like how it's like a counterpart to the twin victim. I like how it's a new version of the twin victim that seems to be inspired by Joseph Schrieber. Yeah, it's neat, it's cool, but it's just, you know, it's just not as good as a, a regular Twin Victim, in my opinion. And it's, I don't really think it's as good as any of the monsters above it either, so I'm gonna put it, yeah, it's above the Groner, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm gonna put it like right there, yeah. Okay, the one truth. This boss fight is quite a moment. I actually, I actually like this boss fight. Like, there was so much buildup for this one boss fight. Like, this boss fight gets foreshadowed almost as soon as you get Eileen. Like Henry's like, we well, gotta go down, down into the deepest part of it and find the one truth. And then they find the one truth and it's a giant glorified wall man. But the room it takes place in is so cool. There's like a giant hole in the middle and a beautiful chandelier at the very top. And this boss fight is really satisfying in my opinion. Like, I don't know, like when you find the right one truth and then you just start wailing on it, you give Eileen a weapon as well, and then both you and Eileen are wailing on it together. Like, like that's really satisfying. And this boss fight is just fun to defeat for that reason. Like, I don't know. I just think it's rewarding having a pretty easy boss fight they can just wail on after such a difficult and stressful game. But the only problem is that, like I said about the Wallmen earlier, I just don't like the Wallmen's design. I, th I think it's a very generic looking, even for 2004 standards. But I do like the idea of it. I like the set piece, I like the room it's in. I like the battle strategy. It's just, it looks kinda generic. Honestly, it feels like the developers designed the one truth first, and then they designed the regular wallmen afterwards. Because the wallmen don't feel like they belong outside of this boss arena, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know, the one, like, I don't know, just the wall men fit so well here. The wall men fit so well in this, in this moment, but when you plaster them throughout the rest of the game, they just become kind of meh-ish, like, eh, whatever. Honestly, if the regular wall men were not enemies in the game, and the only wall men in the game was the one truth, then the one truth would be a lot higher. That would be a very interesting boss fight. But just the idea of it being like a glorified normal enemy, a generic looking one at that kind of brings it down a little bit. Even though I do actually like the meaning and symbolism and battle strategy and this boss fight in general. Um, yeah, it, it's going like low A, high B, honestly. Uh, you know what, low A. I think I think I think the set piece is cool enough to warrant it in A tier over B tier. All right, the Conjurer. I really wish Walter was here. Why isn't Walter here? He's kind of like a monster. If Walter was here, he would go in S S S S S plus tier. Okay, Walter would be a top tier monster. I love Walter, but the Conjurer is. Uh, honestly, I I I sort of consider it like the like the wheelchair. Honestly. Like, I don't really consider the Conjurer a boss fight. I consider the Conjurer an obstacle to the true boss fight, which is Walter. Like, like the Conjurer is just the first part of the puzzle to defeating the true final boss. And this artwork of him is pretty cool, but the Conjurer in the game itself is actually not very interesting looking. I mean, it is disturbing, don't get me wrong. Like, it's really creepy how Walter took 
Walter's corpse, if, if that makes sense. And then Walter put his skin over Walter's corpse to make a big Walter. Whoa. So yeah, I think the idea of it is creepy, but I think his design could have been a little... It, it could have been made a little less generic because it looks like another wall man, kind of. You know, it's a fleshy human thing that leans forward. It, it just looks like another wall man. So yeah, I love the final boss in Silent Hill 4. I think it's an amazing part of the series, but I don't love it because of the conjurer. I like it because of Walter. So if Walter was here, he would go an SSSSS plus tier, but the conjurer is going in, uh, I guess the middle of B tier. The idea of the conjurer is amazing. It's just that the design is a little underwhelming. I wish it looked more like this artwork here. This is very nice artwork, has very good lighting on it. But in the game itself, it does not look like this at all. I actually wish it looked more like how it did on the official soundtrack. All right, now we have the Silent Hill Origins nurse. This is not the only nurse in Silent Hill Origins, but it's the only nurse in Silent Hill Origins on this tier list that someone else made. It's like they took the Silent Hill 2 nurse and they were like, yeah, do that. But its behavior is kind of unique. Like, I like how when you down them, they start smacking their head up against the floor. That's kind of unique. The previous Silent Hill nurses didn't do that. But this is the fourth Silent Hill nurse, and it has nothing on the previous Silent Hill nurses. No offense to the developers, they did a decent job. But honestly, this is like an F tier monster. Like, I get it. I know why they're there. I know the symbolism. I understand. You know, it's just, I, I just, I just don't care about them. The Origins nurse is my least favorite nurse because every other nurse has something interesting about it. Well, kind of, but this nurse, it really doesn't. The only thing interesting about this nurse is that it smacks its head up against the ground when you, when you defeat them, that's it. And I guess it is kind of funny how Travis asks the nurse if it's okay. You very rarely see Silent Hill characters actually talking to monsters. So I really like how in Silent Hill Origins, you actually do get a few moments where Travis talks to the monsters. But yeah, F tier, this monster, it, it means nothing to me. All right, this is the Silent Hill Origins line figure. This enemy is really annoying. Like, I wish if they were gonna take the line figure from Silent Hill 2, I wish they didn't give it an even more annoying acid attack. And they're deceptively fast. And these enemies can hone on you from a very far distance, so you can be running in the overworld, I mean in Silent Hill, and you'll be trying to run away from a fucking great jacket here, and it will follow you to like the other side of town! These enemies just do not give up once they start chasing you. And usually I wouldn't mind that, usually I wouldn't mind an aggressive enemy, but what I don't like about this enemy is that it changes the camera. So when you enter, it's... UTE quick time event, the camera just gets spun around and then you have to like readjust yourself and it's just like, ugh. Other aggressive Silent Hill enemies will not spin you around because of some dumb quick time event. Like when a slurper knocks you down in Silent Hill 3, the camera is still facing wherever it was facing previously. Getting knocked down does not turn the camera around in Silent Hill 3, but in Silent Hill Origins, I don't know, just that moment where I have to recheck my map after getting grabbed by a straitjacket, it, it just gets to me. It, it's one of the few things that really irritates me. Honestly, it's going in F tier. I, I don't like this monster at all. All right, the Carrion. Now we're getting to the good stuff. I like this monster. I like this monster a lot. This monster reminds me a lot of the Insane Cancer, except unlike the Insane Cancer, the Carrion is actually dangerous. So in Silent Hill 3, the Insane Cancer was typically put in places where you would have to maneuver around it, which is pretty scary because, you know, you don't want to get close to that Insane Cancer. Woo, scary. But in Silent Hill Origins, it's the same thing but with the Carrion. And the Carrion can fuck you up. There is nothing more dreading than seeing a Carrion guarding some health supplies. Thinking to yourself, okay, how can I go about this. If I use a melee weapon, it might hit me. If I use a gun, it might buffer the shots and still hit me. I could try to sneak around it somehow. Like this is an enemy you want to avoid. 
but I think it's used very effectively. Because if you're good enough, if you're good enough, you can deal with them. You can stun lock them just like any other enemy. The trick, really, is to get the first hidden. If you get the first hidden, you basically win. But that's what's scary about it. If you don't get the first hidden, then you're probably screwed. So, so when you see a carrion in Silent Hill Origins and you think to yourself, ah, do I want to get past that carrion? And then you think, yes, you need to try to approach it in a way where you get the first hit on it. You have to wait for it to turn around or something, or you gotta shoot it in the dark. You could try to sneak past it by turning your flashlight off and walking past it, but that is so nerve wracking. And I don't know, like when you first enter the sanitarium basement and that creepy song starts playing and you see a carrion walk down the hall, that's an effective introduction. I think that's the first time you see a carrion in the game, if I recall. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's in the sanitarium basement. I think that's the first time you see them. Like, I don't know, I think this is a very effective enemy in Silent Hill Origins. This is an enemy you need to think about every time you see it. You need to think, okay, how am I going to avoid that carrion? And honestly, I think it does its job maybe just as good, if not better, than the Insane Cancer, because they both serve basically the same purpose. They're both enemies that you kind of need to sneak past to get supplies sometimes. And I don't know, I think I dread trying to get past a carrion more than I dread trying to get past an Insane Cancer. But they're still manageable. This idea that they're cheap and will hit you no matter what, that is not true. Get good. Get better at the game. So yeah, I love this enemy and it's getting my defense. Alright, this is the enemy I was talking about when I was going over the Silent Hill 4 wheelchair. This is essentially a better version of the Silent Hill 4 wheelchair in my opinion. It does the whole light thing with the shadow way more effectively. Also, its name is really cool. This thing's called a Remnant. That's a cool name. It's so depressing how the best version of Silent Hill Origins which is the PSP version emulated on a computer. It's it's really upsetting how this enemy does not work in that version. Ah, the shadows don't work when emulating this game. So this enemy loses its charm, but this enemy is actually really cool. And the sound design, this enemy sounds scary. This is this is another very effective Silent Hill Origins enemy and I'm putting it in A tier. Mama is the name of this enemy. And I love this enemy. This is one of my favorite boss fights in the series. And it's going in SSSSS plus tier. I absolutely love this boss fight. Like, I love this boss fight's design. I love the build up to it. This enemy has one of the creepiest death animations of any Silent Hill monster. It like retracts up into the ceiling, kind of jittery like and it screams while doing so. Just this enemy's death animation is so haunting. And this monster symbolism, I love the symbolism. I love how it relates to Travis. I like how it's like a personal, a, a very introspective kind of monster. It's like a look into Travis's childhood. Like I remember when I was first playing Silent Hill Origins and I got to this part, I was just like, Ugh, that's how this guy views his mother? Ooh, this guy must be fucking crazy. <laughs> And yeah, it is a really easy boss fight, but that doesn't matter. I just think everything else about this boss fight is so cool. Also, it's funny. This, the the straight jacket, this is also technically a boss fight, I guess. Just felt like mentioning that it is a boss fight. But yeah, Mama, the second Silent Hill Origins boss fight gets my seal of approval. It's going in the top tier. All right, Sad Daddy. This is also a really cool boss fight. I like this one a lot and I think I'm gonna pair it with Mama, yeah. I think they deserve to be together in the same tier, definitely. These are two very effective boss fights in Silent Hill Origins. They really help you get into the protagonist's head, and the lead up to this boss fight is one of the creepiest scenes in all of Silent Hill. Like, the cutscene leading up to this boss fight is so disturbingly haunting. It's up there with Abstract Daddy, so yeah, whenever I play Silent Hill Origins, I greatly look forward to these two boss fights. I just think the build up to both of them is very well done, in my opinion at least. And it might seem a little bit over the top, you know? Like, okay, the trucker who just so happened to wander into Silent Hill on this one day also just so happens to have this incredibly fucked up past involving his parents. Like, okay, I get it, it is a little over the top, but I still love it. It's a video game, okay? I love confronting Travis's fucked up past, and 
Yeah, they're, they're, they're both going in SSSS plus tier. Like, genuinely speaking, I think these boss fights are great moments. These are very underrated moments in the series. If you're watching this and you've never played Silent Hill Origins, because you kept hearing that Silent Hill Origins was trash and it breaks the canon and all that stuff, guess what? Ignore that. You're missing out on some great stuff. You're missing out on some amazing boss fights. I'm being serious. Like, yes, they are very easy. They're, they're not hard at all. But just the story and the buildup and the design, it's its everything Silent Hill should be. Okay, the Ariel. I like this monster. Th this monster is pretty unique. I like how when you knock them on the floor, they start walking on their hands. And the symbolism is incredibly ambiguous. Like, no one really knows what this monster symbolizes. Honestly, Silent Hill Origins is very underrated when it comes to the monsters, in my opinion. You really do have some cool stuff in this game, and I think I'm going to rank the Ariel with the remnants. Yeah, it's going right next to the remnants, right there. Honestly, okay, honestly, these monsters are not as good as the uh, as the Closer or the, or the Mandarin, but yeah, they're still very, very good monsters. The two-back is this game's final dungeon monster. You know, every Silent Hill game has the final dungeon monster. You know, in Silent Hill 1, you had the Stalker. Silent Hill 2, you had the you had the abstract daddies in the hotel. Silent Hill 3, you have the Scraper. Silent Hill Origins, I mean, Silent Hill 4, you had the bottom. And now you have Silent Hill Origins, and in Silent Hill Origins, you get the two back in the motel. And I do like this monster. I don't really have any problems with it. You, you know, like, I don't like it as much as the Ariel or the Remnants, because those monsters are just very interesting. But this monster, you know, I think it's a pretty decent uh, final dungeon monster. It kind of reminds me of Abstract Daddy from Silent Hill 2. In fact, it's probably definitely taking some inspiration there. But really, it, it really just is not as interesting as the Remnant or the Ariel at all. So I'm just going to put it below that. I'm not going to put it in A tier. I'm going to put it in uh, B tier. I'm going to put it below the Float Stinger. Yeah. Right below the Float Stinger seems to be a good spot for it in my opinion all right the butcher i love this monster this is a very underrated monster i love my pyramid head ripoffs i love them give me more pyramid head ripoffs i'm being serious the more pyramid head ripoffs we get the better and i'm gonna put him right next to pyramid head in s tier just to piss people off okay i don't know where to fit the stalker into this because the because the stalker is not here but if I were to rank the Stalker, I would put it in the middle of A tier, I think. I think it's a really cool monster. You know, it's kind of neat how in the school you see these uh, larva Stalkers, and then near the end of the game in the final dungeon, you see the Stalker. So I kind of like how, you know, in the first dungeon, you saw the first version of them, and then the final dungeon, you see the final version of them. So that's really cool. But honestly, besides that, it's just... I don't, I don't really care about the Larva Stalker or the Stalker that much. So yeah, I would put it in like A tier. It, it would either go in the middle of A tier or at the bottom of A tier. Uh, the only reason why it's not going in B tier is because I do think it is a little better than the monsters in B tier. Like it's definitely more interesting than the Romper and the Air Screamer. Definitely the Stalker. Okay, now we have the Caliban. As a boss fight, it's going into low C, high D tier. It's not very interesting. It's very, very easy. But as an enemy, as a normal enemy that appears in the motel and the streets, that's like a high A tier monster right there. Like I love the scale and sound design of this monster. Like, I love how giant it is. I love how it blocks the whole street. The sound design is so good. Like, I love the, like, I like the concrete sound its, its feet makes as it glides across the ground. Like, I love this monster. Like, it's crazy. When you fight this monster in the theater, you're, you're, you're not expecting it to be a normal monster afterwards. You're expecting it to stay a boss monster. And if it does come back, you know, you think maybe it would be rescaled like the abstract daddy was, but that doesn't happen. The normal Caliban's, not the boss one, the normal Caliban's in the motel and in the streets after the boss Caliban are identical to the boss Caliban. And that's cool in my opinion. They might have less health, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I think they have less health, but their scale is the same. And I don't know, I just love seeing a monster that big 
in Silent Hill. I wish there were more. I, I wish there were more monsters of this size in Silent Hill. So high A, low S. Uh, we have a lot of S tier monsters. I think we got to put it in A tier. As a boss fight, it's the worst boss fight in Origins. But as a normal enemy, it is one of the best enemies in Origins. So yeah, I think the boss fight brings it down a little bit. So it's not going in S tier. Also, the foreshadowing is cool. I like how you read that Alessa didn't like the Caliban in the play. And then you fight the Caliban, and then after you defeat the Caliban, Alessa kicks it. I love that. Okay, Alessa's dream. Okay, so I like the cutscenes that surround this boss fight. Like, I think it's cool that Travis falls asleep, and then he defeats this creature from inside Alessa's subconscious. And then it has, like, a real-world physical effect on the Floros. I think that's really cool. And I really like the part where the demon gets sucked into the Floros. I think that's a really cool cutscene. And the music is really good, and so is the boss arena. So I think everything surrounding this boss fight is pretty cool. But the boss fight itself is going into, like, high D tier, in my opinion. The only reason why it's not going in F tier is because I think the music and boss arena are really good, and I think the cutscenes around it are really good. So those are the only things saving it from going to the bottom tier. I don't know, it's design just... You know, I like that it's twitchy. You know, that's pretty cool. And I kind of like how it sort of looks like how you could imagine a little girl imagines a demon like you know dahlia said the florist was a cage for a demon so this is how alessa imagined it so i guess that's kind of neat ish you know so it's reasonable to assume it wouldn't be that scary because it's just a little girl imagining it but honestly just the design like i feel bad for the developers of origins because the FMVs were already made when they started working on the game. And this boss fight was in the FMVs. So it's kind of too late at that point. You can't, you can't change it. Because I know Climax would have done a better design than this. If they were able to work on the game before those FMVs got made. So it's kind of an unfortunate situation. But yeah, I think everything surrounding the boss fight is pretty cool. But the boss fight itself is kind of pathetic. And it's not scary. And it's very anticlimactic. When you compare this to every other Silent Hill final boss, it does not compare at all. Like, it has some cool attacks, I guess, but it doesn't even look like a Silent Hill monster. Like, it looks like something you would see in Elder Scrolls or Diablo or something. It is one of the least Silent Hilly Silent Hill monsters, so it's going at the bottom of D tier. Alright, here we have the Silent Hill Homecoming Nurse. The fact that you can see a baby in its womb when you shine a light on it is pretty cool. And I think its sound design is pretty cool. Like, I like how you can kind of hear some camera flashes, it sounds like, as this enemy moves around. So those two things are pretty cool. But I'm kind of sick of seeing it, honestly. Like, this nurse is everywhere. Like, you see this art of this nurse everywhere. Like, I think I've seen it in, like, 40 different YouTube thumbnails. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but really, this nurse render is really overused. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of tired of seeing it. It's going in, like, D tier for me. Okay, now we have the feral. If the feral looked like how it did in the official art, I think that would be a cool monster. But it doesn't at all, and I'm gonna put it in high F tier. Like, I think they're fun to fight. I like how when you shoot them in the middle of their charge, they get stunned. That's pretty cool. And when they're stunned, you can do some pretty cool finishers on them. That's also pretty cool. So yeah, they're fun to fight and deal with, but their design is awful. The official art has translucent skin. That's cool. That's neat. But in the game, it looks like Silly Putty. It does not look this good in the game at all. In the game, it looks like crap. Which is weird because enemies in Silent Hill Homecoming typically have pretty good texture work on them. Except for the feral, it, it seems like the developers didn't even finish this enemy. This this feels like a beta enemy. So yeah, they're fun to fight, but they are one of the worst looking Silent Hill enemies in the series, so it's going in F tier. Genuinely, I think the design is worse than Alessa's dream, because at least Alessa's dream was twitchy and had kind of cool wings on its back that were also kind of twitchy antenna-like things. But there's nothing interesting about this monster's design. And the biggest kicker is that it has translucent skin in the official art. 
What gives? That would have been cool to have in the game, but it's not in the game. Oh well. The Swarmer... Uh, it's kind of funny how they can just latch onto Alex's face. And Alex doesn't even react. He only reacts once you start mashing the dodge button. But yeah, this is like one of the most forgettable enemies in the series. But this enemy is really forgettable. Like, if this enemy was not on this tier list, I wouldn't even notice it was missing. Or maybe I might notice, I don't know. I guess I'll put it below the creeper. Because putting it above the creeper would do the creeper injustice. Honestly, it would have been cooler if the swarmer in Silent Hill Homecoming was just the creeper again. Alright, the needler. I like the cutscene where Alex sees the needler in full for the first time. He goes, you gotta be shitting me. And I think that's pretty funny. I do like that cutscene. Honestly, I like Alex's reactions a lot in Silent Hill Homecoming. But this enemy is super inconsistent. Like sometimes the pipe will stun them. Sometimes it will not. Sometimes you'll dodge to the side of it when you hit the dodge button. And sometimes you won't. Like sometimes getting to the side of this enemy is really easy. And sometimes it's a huge pain in the ass. And for some reason, some godforsaken reason, one of the loading screen hints in this game says to shoot the needler in the head. What? That is terrible advice. I think they're cool in the hotel, but after that point, they kind of overstayed their welcome. You know, they're kind of scary in the hotel. I like how when you walk down the hallway and then look back, there might be a needler that spawned behind you. I like how they come out of the holes in the walls. And I like how it's possibly foreshadowing to the final boss because the final boss comes out of a hole in the ceiling and this enemy comes out of holes throughout the game. And it also looks like a spider like the final boss. And its head is positioned kind of like a baby during childbirth, which could tie into the final boss giving birth as well. But honestly, this enemy overstays its welcome. It, it can be rather annoying. Just, I don't know, sometimes these things are so easy to fight, and sometimes they're just a huge pain in the ass. Which is weird because my battle strategy never changes, it's basically the same every time, but sometimes it just won't work. Sometimes I just cannot get to the side of these things or behind them at all. So yeah, this monster is going low, it's going in like C tier. Not D tier, because there are some cool things about it, but it but it is just a really annoying monster to fight. Alright, the Schism, this is a very underrated monster. That promo art of Alex fighting the Schism is one of my favorite official Silent Hill artworks of all time. And the symbolism, this monster is so symbolic. People call Homecoming a shallow game, that is not true. There's actually some very interesting and some deep things in Homecoming that the developers very clearly put a lot of into a lot of very subtle things in homecoming and this monster proves that this monster is a very solid monster it does not feel out of place at all they're really fun to fight you can do some cool finishers on them i think it's so cool dodging this thing slash attack and seeing it barely graze alex and you can see like a drop of blood come off alex but it does no damage that's cool that's badass in the other world house this is a very effective enemy in the other world house I think there's four of them in that dungeon. And every schism is strategically placed to represent a member of Alex's family. So yeah, this is a really cool monster. This gets my seal of approval. I'm putting it in S tier. And another monster that gets my seal of approval from Homecoming is the Lurker. I like this monster. I do. I love how when you hit it in the head just right, its head flies clean off. And you can kill it in one hit that way. That's really cool. Just, I don't know, just I feel like this enemy fits in perfectly with the Silent Hill enemies from Silent Hill 1 through 4. And this monster, along with the schism, is proof that the developers cared about what they were making. Because besides the enemies that are taken from the movie, so the Nurse Pyramid Head and the Order Soldier, besides those enemies, the original enemies that are in Homecoming are actually really good. And if you've never played Homecoming, then you're missing out on some great monsters. Like, I don't know, I've heard it be said so much that Silent Hill Homecoming does not feel like a Silent Hill game. And in my opinion, it does feel like a Silent Hill game because all of the monsters feel like Silent Hill monsters to me. And I think the Lurker is a nice, simple, easy monster to deal with that never really is annoying or gets in your way. I like how it's a mermaid thing. I think that's cool. And this monster gets my seal of approval and I'm putting it in 
A tier. Hold on a second. I'm going to do some re-ranking here. I'm going to put the mumbler below the mandarin and the closer. And I'm going to put the lurker below the mandarin and the closer as well. There you go. That, that looks better to me. Okay. The smog. Oh boy. This one's going to make people angry. I like this enemy. I really like this enemy. I like how it glows. I think that's cool. I love the part in the hotel where you have to go back outside and you see the smog that wasn't there before and you see how the smog just glows in the dark. It, it's so cool to me. This enemy looks amazing in dark locations in Silent Hill Homecoming. People playing Silent Hill Homecoming tend to make this mistake where they play with the brightness all the way up because admittedly it is a very dark game, but trust me, just play the game with the default brightness. Your eyes will adjust, you'll get used to it. And the default brightness in Homecoming looks way better than the brightness on its highest setting. And seeing this enemy in a nice dark area is so cool, which is funny because the first time you see the smog, it's just like outside in the streets. It would have been way more effective if the first time you saw the smog was in the hotel. If that's the first smog you saw, then that would have been cool. That would have been scary. But unfortunately, there were like a dozen smogs before then. But yeah, I like this enemy. I think it has a really cool design. I love my line figure ripoffs. Give me more line figure ripoffs. I'm going to put it right next to the line figure just to piss people off. Also, this enemy is not that bad to fight. Get good. Sepulcher is a really cool boss fight. The cutscene leading up to Sepulcher is one of my favorite cutscenes in the entire franchise. Like, I love Alex's reaction. It's pretty video gamey, you know? Like, you have to destroy the four sacks in order to get to its weak spot. So it does feel pretty video gamey, but I don't really care. It is a video game. The symbolism is disturbing. The boss theme is amazing. I love how it falls into a giant hole when it dies. That's really cool. Like this boss fight, in my opinion, is a really good first impression for Silent Hill Homecoming. Because I mean, come on, when I first got to this boss fight, I was like, oh yeah, hell yeah, this game is happening. I was like, damn, if this is the first boss fight, then I wonder what the other bosses are going to look like. This is a super underrated boss fight, in my opinion, and I kind of want to put it in S tier. I do. This is, this, this is actually a really good boss fight. And I know some people hate it because they hate the combat in this game, but this boss fight works really well with the combat system in this game. You know, the dodges work, the hits work. This boss fight works, okay? I really do believe this is a great moment in Silent Hill Homecoming, and it shows that the developers definitely had something going on. You know, like this boss fight is a highlight, in my opinion. All right, the Order Soldier is going in tier. Awful. Awful. Why do they reuse all of Alex's animations? I think they even use his death animation when they die. What? Every time I see an Order Soldier, it takes me right out of the game because I'm like, oh, wow, look, that enemy. It's reusing all of my animations. And you can't shoot them when they go down ladders because the devs didn't want to make an animation for when they die on a ladder. Just this enemy is so lazy and it takes me out of the experience every time because I can physically see how much of a copy and paste job this enemy is. They literally just took Alex in the unlockable Order Soldier costume and just pasted him throughout the game. It honestly would have been way more effective if it was like a dark version of Alex that was an enemy. That way I'll find it more believable that it's reusing all of Alex's animations. But the fact that these are supposed to be different characters, unique from Alex, makes it so glaring and awkward when you see one run towards you with Alex's same exact running animation and then you see it swing at you with Alex's same exact swinging animation, and then you see it die using Alex's same exact death animation. Also, what's funny, the developers not giving them death animations while on ladders is not the only reason why this enemy cannot be damaged while on a ladder. The other reason is because Alex himself cannot be damaged when climbing ladders. So they literally copy and pasted Alex's exact behaviors and just gave it to an enemy, which I am not against in and of itself. 
You know, like Memory of Alessa and Silent Hill 3 just reused all of Heather's animations. The reason why I have a problem with it in Homecoming is because these Order Soldiers are unique characters. It's just so awkward and takes me out of the experience when they all act just like Alex. And it's funny, I think Wheeler also reuses all of the same animations as Alex. Ugh. Like, I'm sorry, developers, I love Homecoming, I'll always defend it, but this enemy, no. Alright, Siam. This is a really cool enemy. This enemy sparks some theories. This is a cool enemy. Like, when you kill it, you get the Shades of James achievement. So, does this monster have to do with James from Silent Hill 2 somehow? Whoa. Like, could a remnant of James' psyche possibly have lingered of Silent Hill long enough for it to now be manifesting in Alex's other world? That's cool if that's the case. And this enemy is kind of satisfying to fight. Like, I like how when you hit it in the back, it does extreme damage. Three shotgun blasts will kill it, so it's really not much to worry about, honestly. And yeah, I just think it's another solid monster in Silent Hill Homecoming. Good job, developers. You made some solid monsters so far and Siam gets my seal of approval. Also, the sound design is nice and creepy. Like, I like how it, like, cries and moans when you fight it. And its design, like, man, that's disturbing. Like, I love how its nose are the arms tied together. That's interesting. And I will put it in A tier. Okay, Asphyxia. I love this enemy's death animation. I love how Alex climbs on its back and then forces it to breathe. And the cutscene leading up to this boss fight, I love that cutscene. I love Alex's reaction to it. But my problem with this boss is that it's very misleading. There is an attack it does that hits everybody. Every time I watch a Let's Play, whether or not it's a blind Let's Play or someone who's already played the game before, there is a certain attack that will always hit the player. And that is because they try to dodge the attack. They try to avoid the attack with the dodge button. You're not supposed to dodge that attack. You're supposed to run away from it, which is super cheap because it looks like you should be able to dodge it. It looks like dodging should work, but no, you have to do something that the game has taught you not to do and avoid the attack by strafing. You do not do that with any other enemy in the game. You do not strafe to avoid any attack, except for Asphyxia's grab attack. So that's kind of unfair. That's kind of inconsistent. But yeah, I do like this boss fight. I like how when you know what you're doing, this boss fight can be over in like a second. Okay, not a second, I'm exaggerating. But you can end this boss fight really quickly. You just have to shoot it a few times, smack it in the butt a few times, and then you do the quick time event, and then the, the boss fight's over and it's easy. So yeah, this is a solid boss fight, but in my opinion, it's probably the worst boss in the game. I mean, I still like it, it's just when you're competing with Sepulcher and Scarlet and Amnion, it's just, it, 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 it's not as interesting in my opinion. But yeah, the music, symbolism, the build up to the boss fight, and the cutscene after the boss fight, they're all very good. The boss arena, the boss arena for this boss is really cool. You fight it in like a gas chamber, I think, or something? And there's a giant window in the room? I don't know, it's a very interesting boss arena. And I love how it destroys the chair by stepping on it in the cutscene. I love Alex's reaction to that, he kinda flinches at that, I like that a lot. So yeah, solid monster, but I'm not gonna put it in S tier because I know that a lot of people have a lot of trouble with this boss fight, and I think that one attack that is almost impossible to dodge without strafing is kinda cheap. So I'm going to put this in, uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to put it in high B because I know that people tend to have a lot of trouble with this boss fight and it's kind of counterintuitive. But once you know what you're doing, it's not a bad fight at all. Also, the sound design on this enemy is very underrated. This enemy sounds really weird. It kind of squeaks weirdly. It, it almost sounds like a car horn in a way. It's kind of hard to hear, but next time you fight this boss, pay attention and you'll realize how weird and creepy it sounds. Scarlet. Okay, one of the best Silent Hill songs ever. I love Scarlet's theme for Phase 2. Like, I love how the bass just fucking drops in the first 10 seconds. God, I love that song. And the cutscene leading up to it, man, the, the, the cutscenes in Homecoming are very underrated. But yeah, this boss fight symbolism and its movements and the way it looks, it's all very, very good. 
I love how when you shoot up the shotgun, that does insane damage, and all of its plastic just cracks all over the place. And then you see it bleed through the cracks. God, that's so cool. This is an amazing monster. And even people who hate Homecoming tend to like this boss fight. I think I'm going to put an SSSSS plus tier because I really do love this boss fight. And I think it's a fan favorite. I don't know. I'm just assuming. I know the fans hate Homecoming because Homecoming is fucking trash. Okay, I get it. You know, zero out of 10, bad game, no redeeming qualities. Every boss fight and every enemy fucking sucks. The music sucks. I get it. It breaks the lore. The developers didn't understand Silent Hill. But I think even despite all of that, I think fans fans still see this as a fan favorite. I think this is a popular boss fight in the fan base. So that warrants it to go the highest tier because if something in Homecoming managed to become a fan favorite, then th that's saying something. Silent Hill fans do everything they can to shit on the Western games. They look at every single little specific thing they can complain about and they complain about it. They try to see the negative in every single little thing. If they can somehow make up some bullshit reason for why something is awful, then they will. But despite that, Scarlet's still a fan favorite. It even got through to the haters. So yeah, amazing monster. Homecoming does have amazing monsters in general, in my opinion. And Scarlet is going in the top tier. Wait a minute, I just realized Curtis isn't here. Curtis. There we go. That's where Curtis goes. Right there. Okay, Amnion. The last boss in a game with great boss fights. Where would I rank this one? You know, like I said, when I first fought Sepulcher. I thought to myself, God damn, if this is the first boss, then I wonder what the last boss is going to be like. The game set very high expectations very early. And what you get as the last boss is one of the most symbolic, personal, disturbing bosses in the series. Silent Hill Homecoming is a cult-centered game, and typically in the cultish Silent Hill games, you get final bosses that have to do with the cult in a way. Like in Silent Hill 1, you had Incubus. Silent Hill 3, you had God. In Origins, you had whatever the fuck this was. And I am so thankful that we did not get a cult boss for the end of Homecoming. I'm so thankful that it's not a demon or god thing. It is a personal, symbolic boss fight that has to do with Alex as a character. And that's way more interesting than if we had to fight God for the fifth time. And I was expecting it too. I was expecting some sort of God creature as the final boss because the characters previously talked to the other bosses like they were deities. You know, like if Sepulcher Bartlett was like, I only wish to serve you. Please protect me in this moment of, and then he gets crushed to death. And then you have Scarlet who Fitch said forgive me too. And yeah, it is his daughter he's saying forgive me too. But that's also kind of something someone might say to a god. So I don't know, it just felt like this game was foreshadowing to another god thing. And I'm so glad it didn't. I'm glad it took the Silent Hill 2 route and gave us a personal final boss. And Amnion's badass. She's really fun to fight. I like how fast she attacks. People typically try to use guns on this boss fight, but I like to go into it melee style because I think that's way more fun than shooting it down. Its design seems inspired by Junji Ito, which is really cool. And the theme for this boss is so good. It sounds like something straight out of Silent Hill 1. Akira Yamaoka channeling his Silent Hill 1 for this soundtrack. And I love the cutscene leading up to this boss fight. Like, I don't know, I just love Alex's reaction to seeing the tomb go into the ground. And then he slowly backs away and he starts to see the room around him transform. Like you can tell he's expecting something to spawn out of nowhere. And then he turns around and it startles him. God, I love that cutscene. This is either a love it or hate it boss fight. A lot of people think this boss fight is very annoying, but I like this boss fight a lot. And honestly, I think it deserves to go next to Scarlet because this is one of the most interesting and interpretable and disturbing bosses in all of Silent Hill. And I just love my personal Silent Hill boss fights. I love playing as a character who confronts their demons head on because I just think that's badass, okay? I actually have a video going over all of the Silent Hill Homecoming boss fights. So if anybody wants to watch that, then I'll link it in the description. I go over more of my thoughts there, but we gotta get a move on. All right, I think that's every 
homecoming monster again this tier list was actually missing a lot of monsters as i was going through it but i'm pretty sure i talked about every monster in one way or another up to this point so now we're gonna go on to wait what the fuck is valtiel missing oh my god valtiel's not here okay all right so to alleviate this issue of there being so many monsters missing at the very end of this video i'll add in some little pngs to represent which tiers the missing monsters would have gone into but valtiel is a b tier monster in my opinion it's pretty cool how you can see him randomly throughout the game and similarly to pyramid head it feels like he's doing his duty like he feels like he's the caretaker of the other world you know and i know he's a fan favorite it's just personally he doesn't really stick out to me in fact i didn't even know he was missing until just now so yeah i'll be sure to add in all of the monsters that aren't here at the very end but i'm pretty sure i talked about every monster in some way or another up to this point even if it wasn't on the tier list i probably mentioned it at least once so now we're going to go on the shattered memories with the rorschachs this enemy has a very cool gimmick that i'm really hoping they possibly bring back in another silent hill game this enemy changes depending on how you play and that is very interesting i like that a lot so the gimmick is amazing actually i wouldn't call it a gimmick it's more like a feature anyway yeah the idea behind this enemy is really cool i think it has like four different variations or something my favorite variation is the one that's all tangled and abstract but honestly i think this enemy's default design is rather generic looking i think they're generic looking on purpose you know like it's supposed to be like kind of a canvas like you're kind of supposed to mold this enemy into what you want it to be it's supposed to be vague and interpretable but there are so many enemies that are vague and interpretable without being so generic looking so i don't know like their movements and behavior is really cool and their sound design is pretty spooky and those chase sequences are a lot of fun but just genuinely speaking it's design pretty generic i think i'm gonna put it in like high a tier because while they have a lot of good things about them it's just i don't think they're scary it would have been much cooler if it looked more like a rush act test you know what i mean like imagine if there were these weird inky monsters chasing you around shattered memories that would have been way cooler than these in alien things and i feel bad for putting it in a tier because i think every silent hill game deserves a monster in s or sssss plus tier but just i don't know it's just that design is looks generic for, to me but honestly is everything else about this monster good enough to put it in s tier because it's their design that really brings them down to me like their animations movements and behavior is very good their sound design is very good their symbolism is very good the, the idea behind them is very good i love their gimmick or or feature of changing throughout the game depending on how you play they change but it's just their physical design is not good in my opinion and they're everywhere it's the only enemy in shattered memories you know what fuck it i'm putting an s tier i'm gonna look past the design and everything else about this enemy is very good and more than makes up for it okay i'm looking at downpour and i can already see that two of my favorite monsters are missing where's the wall corpse and where's my angry red circle of death okay honestly the wall corpse would go in like low b high c i like how they're typically attached to the cult symbols you know i've heard it be said that silent hill downpour has no traces of the cult in it but that is not true there, there is some cult imagery in downpour there's about as much cult imagery in downpour as there is in silent hill 2 and one of those things is the wall corpse it's attached to a halo of the sun so that's pretty cool Honestly, I do think its design is more interesting than the Silent Hill 4 Wallmen, so I think that warrants the wall corpse to be above it. So yeah, it would go in C tier probably, maybe B tier if I'm being very generous. And I like their sound design. Their sound design is weird and creepy. It sounds like a bird that's struggling to fly. It's kind of weird. It sounds like... That was not a good impersonation at all anyway yeah i would put it in maybe c tier maybe b tier if i'm being very generous and then we have the angry red circle of death 
the angry red circle of death would go in SSSSS plus. No, I'm, no, I'm just joking. I do like how it could be seen as a continuation of the red light in Borley's Haunted Mansion in Silent Hill 3. And I think the particle effect when it tears Murphy apart is pretty cool. But honestly, it's not that interesting. It would probably go in like C tier or something. I don't hate the red angry circle of death as much as everybody else. I find it completely inoffensive. But it's not that interesting, it's not really a real enemy, so it'd probably just go in like C tier. Alright, now we have the Screamer. Okay, say what you want about this enemy's design. Its design is rather generic. I do kind of like how we get our own version of the Grunge Girl in Silent Hill though, but besides that, its design is just whatever. Where this enemy shines is the behavior. This enemy has really interesting mannerisms. Like, I don't know, just like the next time you see one of these things in the distance, just watch it. Look at what it does. It's really interesting. I can't really remember off the top of my head what they do. But I remember the last time I played Downpour, I was just watching a few of them in the distance, and I thought their mannerisms were very interesting. Like, I think they pretend to cradle a baby. I think they hold their head and pretend to cry. Their sound design is very interesting, like when you kill them, they emit static, like a TV signal going out. I don't know, I think this is an underrated enemy. I think people look at its design and then write it off without taking into consideration its sound design, its mannerisms, animations, and possible symbolism. I'm gonna put it in B tier. Okay, the minion. I'm already seeing another enemy from Downpour missing. Where's the wheel man and where's the juggernaut? Also, Anne? Anne's one of my favorite characters. Where's Anne? There we go, Anne goes there. Okay, but the minion is taken straight out of Condemned Criminal Origins. This is not an original design at all, and their mannerisms and sound design is not as interesting as the Screamer at all. This enemy feels very unfinished, and I'm gonna put it in F tier. This enemy is so bad that I have nothing to say about it. I genuinely don't know what else to say about this monster, so I'm gonna move on to the next monster. Alright, the Weeping Bat. I like how Murphy screams fuck at it. That's pretty cool. I've heard people complain about this monster getting attached to the ceiling too often, and how it can be annoying to wait for them to come down so you can finally fight them. And my advice for that is to either throw your weapon, because Murphy will actually hit them when they're on the ceiling if he throws a weapon, or just don't bother fighting them, because you never have to fight these things. If it's on the ceiling and it won't come down, then, you know, screw it, just move on. You don't have to engage with them. You don't have to kill them to progress. But yeah, I don't think this monster is as bad as everybody says it is, but I think I'm gonna put it in, uh, I don't know, like B tier probably. It feels like a continuation of the Rorschach. And honestly, I think this is what the Rorschach probably should have looked like, because I do think its design is more interesting than the Rorschach, despite how similar they look. But this enemy has none of the interesting gimmicks that makes the Rorschach interesting. It's basically a Rorschach if you made it aggressive and took all the character out of it. Honestly, I think I'm gonna put it in C tier, honestly. I think they're kinda scary when you see them for the first time. I do like how you kinda get different versions of the Weeping Bat similarly to the nurses in Silent Hill 2, and most of the enemies in Silent Hill 1. You know, there's a pale Weeping Bat that looks kinda clean, and then you have the dirty and grungy Weeping Bat. So I kind of like how it follows the tropes of the monsters in Silent Hill 1 and 2 of having a normal and dark world variation. And I like Murphy's realistic reaction to them, but it is rather generic looking in my opinion. What the fuck? I'm now noticing that another monster is missing from Downpour. Where's the monocle man? Enjoy the ride, Murphy. That's my favorite part of the game. God, I love that part. And the monocle man is going into the tier. Okay, now we have the boogeyman. I wish the boogeyman from Homecoming was here. If that boogeyman was here, then I would put that in like C tier. But the boogeyman is going in. Uh, I don't know. Honestly, I think this is a very uninteresting monster. I think fans hate how this monster is another pyramid head, which I think is a stupid complaint. My problem with this monster isn't that it's another pyramid head which it really isn't. My problem with this monster is that this is just a 
genuinely very uninteresting monster to me. Like, honestly, I wish this was a Pyramid Head ripoff because that would be more interesting than what it is now. So Pyramid Head in Silent Hill 2 represents James' desire to be punished. The Boogeyman represents Murphy seeing himself as a monster. They are not the same creature in different skins. But what's interesting about this monster? Its sound design is very generic. It just sounds like a, a bear, I guess. At least with the Butcher and Pyramid Head, you could unlock their weapons. Like with Pyramid Head, you can use the Great Knife in Silent Hill 2, and with the Butcher, you can unlock the Butcher's Knife. But in Downpour, you can't even use this thing's mallet. Honestly, the most interesting thing about this monster is the mallet. Like, that ties into the whole judgment thing it has. And I guess the raincoat ties into Silent Hill Downpour's gimmick, in quotation marks, of it raining during the street segments. I wish Silent Hill games had more varied weather, like in Silent Hill 1. In Silent Hill 1, it would snow at some points, and it would also rain at some points. The only other Silent Hill game to have weather like that is Downpour. It does rain in Downpour, so that's pretty cool. And I guess it is cool how uh, the, the main bad monster is wearing a raincoat because of that. So if I really, really think about it, I can find some interesting things about this monster, but it's going at the bottom of C tier because really, I just don't think it's that interesting. Okay, now I'm gonna go over the wheel man. The wheel man is not here. So just imagine an imaginary wheel man icon. Isn't it a little bit disrespectful to depict a profoundly disabled person as a scary monster. I don't know, I'm probably overthinking it, honestly. But yeah, I think the Wheelman, the last boss is really cool. I genuinely believe it's one of the more underrated moments in the series. I love the door that leads to it. I love how you tilt the justice scales and then that opens up the room to the Wheelman. And I like how the Wheelman is more of a puzzle than a boss fight. You have to run around the room unplugging its life support and I like its attacks. I like how it has like telekinesis and it can conjure furniture from nowhere and then throw it at you. And I like its lightning attack. That's pretty cool. I like how it can use the force to rip the doors on the side of the room apart. And then that spawns enemies from the doors. And I love the theme. I like the song that plays during the battle. It's a very underrated song. And I like how it's a looming monster that appears throughout the game. I like how it's a docile monster that only attacks and serves as the final boss because you're unplugging its life support. Like, I love the tragic misunderstanding there. So yeah, I think it's a very underrated monster. If I overlook how they're depicting a disabled man as a horrific monster, if I overlook that, then I would definitely put it in S tier somewhere. I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking it. I really like the twist how the Wheelman is a representation of Frank. That's just like in Silent Hill 1. In Silent Hill 1, Harry saw Lessa throughout the game, like how Murphy sees the Wheelman throughout the game in Downpour, and Alessa the entire time represented someone that was very close to Harry. Alessa represented Cheryl, and the Wheelman represents Frank. It's poetic, it rhymes. So that's cool, and you know, Murphy's not scared of the wheel man, or at least he doesn't seem scared of it. So it seems like you're supposed to feel bad for it more than anything. You're not supposed to be scared by it. So was it an ableist monster? I mean, I don't know, I guess not. I'm just, I'm just overthinking it. So it would go in S tier, I do think it's really cool. All right, the doll. This is the most underrated Silent Hill monster. I love this monster. This monster has one of the coolest attack strategies in the series. I love how it spawns ghost versions of itself that you can only see with the UV flashlight. And this enemy has one of the coolest introductions of any Silent Hill enemy. So you're exploring downpour and then you go into the basement of that one house and then you see a missing girl on a milk carton and you hear this crying coming from behind a blocked off part of the house. You get to the blocked off part and you find a gun, and then after you acquire the gun, 
bam, there's a doll there. The crying stops and the doll starts attacking you. Ah, scary. I wish Downpour had more moments like that. And this enemy's sound design, I, I love this enemy's sound design. It's creepy how it sounds like it's being pleasured as you hit it. If only every enemy in Downpour was as creative as this enemy. Unfortunately, I don't even think Downpour is finished, but if it had like another year in the oven, I feel like we could have seen more enemies like this and Downpour would have greatly benefited from it. And I think this is a great enemy and it's going the highest tier. I'm being serious. I really do believe this is a very, very underrated enemy. Anyway, next up we have the Juggernaut. Unfortunately, the Juggernaut is not on the tier list, but I would probably put it with the Prisoner Minion. They are threatening and intimidating, so I'll give it that, but they are not much different than the Prisoner Minion in the grand scheme of things. So I think I would just put it in the same tier as the Prisoner Minion. Okay, I think that's every monster. I think I did mention every monster that wasn't on the tier list at some point. Uh, let's see here, would I do any re-ranking? Honestly, looking at this list, I think I did a good job. I don't really feel like I need to re-rank any of these. Uh, maybe the Origins Nurse is too low. I mean, they're not entirely direct copies of the Silent Hill 2 nurse. They do have a unique design. Like they're the only nurse that wears a surgical mask and they're also the only nurse that holds uh, surgical equipment like needles and stuff. You know, I'm gonna put the Origins nurse right next to uh, Alessa's dream. The creeper, should I put the creeper a little higher? It is really cool how it appears in two Silent Hill games. I love seeing a remnant of Alessa's other world take place in James' other world. That's so cool to me. You know what? I think I'm going to put the creeper in C tier. The slurper. Does the slurper deserve the B and D tier? Is this monster that bad? Are they as annoying as pendulums? No. I mean, the thing is, is that I really don't have a problem with this monster. I just know that the strategies that are supposed to work just don't work for everybody. Like, I know some people desperately lay down that beef jerky trying to get the slurper to get distracted by it, and it just leads to frustration. So maybe it does deserve the B and D tier. Maybe there is some inconsistency in its programming. It is pretty cool how this enemy can play dead though. Like it, like sometimes this enemy will stop emitting static and stop moving and it will still be alive, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you know what? You know what? That's it. it it's going to stay in D tier. Honestly, it, it is a D tier monster probably. Okay. One last change I'm going to make is I'm going to put the closer and the Mandarin at the top of A tier instead of the middle of A tier. It's not going in S tier because I do think they're very cheap. The ones in Silent Hill 3 aren't cheap, but they are less interesting than the Mandarin, in my opinion at least, so I think they deserve to go together in the A tier at the very top. Okay, yeah. Man, there's, there, there's a lot to think about here. Like, I'm looking at this thinking, am I going to regret this later? And right now, I don't regret it. Right now, I think this is fine. Uh, I don't know. So yeah, that's how I would rank the monsters. If anybody has any questions, then feel free to comment. Be sure to rank your own monsters in the comments as well. You know, be sure to tell me your favorite monster and your least favorite monster. Actually, more interestingly, tell me what monster you find underrated and overrated. That would be more interesting. So yeah, do I believe the Pendulum and the Order Soldiers are the worst Silent Hill monsters of all time? I would say yes, definitely. I'm going to put Mary above Incubus here. Okay, do I believe God and Mary are the best Silent Hill monsters of all time? Are they my favorite monsters? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. You know what? You know what? Yeah. You know what? I think I would say that God and Mary are my favorite Silent Hill monsters. Now that I really think about it, I think they, yeah. 
because I didn't put them here at the very top for no reason. I don't think Incubus would be my third favorite Silent Hill monster, though. What would be my third favorite Silent Hill monster? Fuck, I don't know. Shit. You know what? I'm overthinking this. I think this is how my ranking is going to stay. Unfortunately, there were a lot of monsters missing from this tier list, but I'm going to start editing this and I'm going to see what I can do about that. Hopefully it won't be that distracting. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching, Dark Warriors.